Okay, we got David, Michael. Yes, Marie, We have everyone. Oh, perfect. Okay. Oh no, we're missing Councillor Moore still. Okay. Hope. Yes. Can you can you rearrange these uh, screens or not? I cannot. Okay. So everyone who's on here for public comments. Um, we ask that you, after you're done your public comments to keep your screen off. And then when you're, when you're called, you can turn your screen on, turn your mic on, and then please leave the meeting and watch from our YouTube channel live, just so that it keeps the screen less cluttered in terms of when we get to voting and things like that, it makes it a lot easier for us. All right. Okay. Let me know when Allison comes on board there. Please. Hope, can I ask how many speakers there are tonight? Yes, there are eight. So we're going to be limiting it to two minutes per person. <laughs> Roughly two minutes per person. Roughly. <laughs> I'll leave it to the mayor to, to call on people, but I'll also have a timer going. If you go substantially over, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. Remotely slap me on the wrist or something. Yes. Yeah. I'll just uh, I'll just uh, mute you. I'm kidding, I Is that Allison coming in there? I'm still missing Councillor Morris. Okay. Maybe I'll just give her a quick call. All right. Cute picture. Councilor Morse's clocks are wrong. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I informed her it was. <laughs> We could, um, Mayor Ender, we could probably just get going on the on the approval of the agenda and opening of the meeting if you'd like. Councilor Morse can join in. All right. Um, I did have an important announcement I was going to make uh, before we started into this, so I'd like Allison to be here. But we'll give her another minute, and then uh, that's all she's getting. She's Thank joining you. now. Sorry, joining. Uh, all right, you there, Allison? Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay, I will call the regular council meeting of Monday, June 8th, 2020. I will call it to order. And just before we get going here, um, before we begin, I would like to take a moment to talk about something that cannot be ignored. As I watch the events unfolding south of the border, I acknowledge that in our own province, in a time when we have come together, 
to keep our communities safe against a global pandemic, our response has been weakened by acts of racist violence. Racism and discrimination have no place in our society, yet, yet here in Canada, as in the US and around the world, racism is too often a reality of day-to-day -day life. While we are proud of the culture and respect and inclusion on Bowen Island, there is still work to be done on all of our parts. We are not immune to racist attitudes and acts. We all have a responsibility to continually, continually reflect on whether our words or actions express, express bias, whether consciously or unconsciously. At the Bowen Island Municipality, we pledge to uphold the Canadian values of diversity and inclusion and to oppose racism and hate in all its forms. We are committed to listening, we are committed to learning, and we are committed to supporting change. Thank you. Um, the approval of the agenda, <laughs> late items, Hope? There are no late items. Sorry? There is no any? late items. Okay, thank you very much. So the approval of the agenda. So moved. Okay, thank you, David. Second. Uh, second. Thanks, Michael. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Aye. Okay, yeah. we'll move into public comments. How many have we got there, Hope? We have eight, eight uh, on the speakers list. Okay. Uh, starting okay. with Bob Turner regarding motorized use on Mount Gardner. Okay, uh, just uh, before we get going here, we're trying to uh, get down, keep it down to around 15 minutes. Yeah, if, we already, if you already have a written speech, I did get an email. You, you are? Yeah. What are you going to say? <laughs> hey, hey, you're live on council meeting. Yeah. So if you, uh, if you have written a letter into the mayor and council, we have received it. And uh, we'd appreciate it if you uh, keep your oral comments sort of short and brief. Thank you very much. And go ahead on the first one, please. Oh. Uh, that's Bob Turner. Oh, good. Hello, Bob. Hello, Mayor and Council. This is Bob Turner. Uh, thank you for your unanimous resolution at the April 27th meeting to request that the province prohibit motorized use on Mount Gardner. I believe your response is appropriate and reflects the support of Bowen Islanders. To start, I note that there are 83 letters in your agenda package supporting this prohibition and none opposing. I have read those letters and what people are saying collectively is that Mount Gardner is something very precious. People find refuge, rejuvenation, recreation, in short wellness and health in the quiet of Mount Gardner's forests. This peacefulness and quiet is a vital part of how we see ourselves as a community as reflected in our own community brand. Some proponents of motorized vehicles say that they, they have been longtime users of Mount Gardner. Yes, but they are a, a, a only a tiny few. I have climbed to the top of Mount Gardner hundreds of times over the past 30 years. Prior to the last few years, I can count on one hand the number of encounters that I've had with motorized vehicles. But during that same time, I've encountered hundreds and hundreds of hikers. And over the past 10 years, the flow of hikers has increased dramatically. It's now common to find 20 hikers or more at the summit of Mount Gardner on a sunny weekend. As your staff report in the agenda package points out, in 2019, 78% of the visitors to the information center were headed for Mount Gardner. But conflict began about two years ago when the Bowen Trail Riders Association, or BITRA, without consultation with the broad community, negotiated with the province the right to work on trails on Mount Gardner. The intention of their work is now clear, to increase access to Mount Gardner for motorbikes and all-terrain vehicles, or ATV. They built two oversized bridges at access points to allow large ATV onto Mount Gardner. Over the past two years, motorized use of Mount Gardner has increased markedly. And as a result, there has been conflict with the rest of the community. It's important to note that BITRA and their motorized vehicles have already taken over about 120 hectares of crown land on and around Radar Hill on South Bowen. BITRA has posted on its own website a map that shows 26 identified trails totaling more than 10 kilometers in length within these 120 hectares. 
This area is now rarely used by hikers because of the noise and the gasoline smell of motorbikes. I do not want this same outcome for Mount Gardner. Most communities with motorized vehicle use have big backcountry areas for this activity. These communities such as Sunshine Coast, Squamish, Chilliwack, border vast crown forests with extensive logging road networks that are used by dirt bikers and ATVs. Bowen has no such backcountry. Our crown lands are tiny and they're set right in the middle of our community. So I conclude, we only have one Mount Gardner. We'll never get another. A broad spectrum of islanders are saying that what they value most in Mount Gardner is being threatened. Council is well-versed in the idea of zoning and incompatible uses. Hiking and motorized vehicles are incompatible uses. I strongly believe that you are doing the right thing in asking the province to prohibit motorized use of Mount Gardner. And I urge you to pass the motion before you in your agenda package. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Oh. I realized I was muted. Ed Walken, regarding- Ed, welcome. Can't hear you, uh, Ed. Yeah, speaker, Ed. You're muted. Perfect. Mayor Ander and Council. My name is Edward Walkman. I live on Deer Walk and I've been a resident of Bowen for almost 20 years. Regarding Council's recommendation to the province on whether to allow or prohibit motorized recreational vehicles on Bowen's Crown lands, I personally believe that all motorized recreational vehicles should be prohibited. And I'd like to offer a uniquely Bowen Island perspective as to why. Several years ago, uh, Sherry Johnson, my wife and business partner, and I conducted the research for the Bowen Island Branding Initiative. The findings of this research from all three stakeholder groups, residents, business owners, and visitors were very specific to Bowen. The research showed that Bowen Island is perceived as a very different place from the rest of the lower mainland. Respondents spoke of Bowen as a haven, a refuge, a, 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 an escape from the hustle, the bustle, the chaos and noise of the mainland. When visitors were asked to write the first three words they associated with Bowen, the most frequently cited word was by far peaceful. We asked residents the same question, and after the word community, the second and third words residents cited were quiet and peaceful. As part of the research, respondents were asked to write stories about their most memorable experiences associated with Bowen. Here are just a few excerpts from those stories. One visitor wrote, I love how it is so tranquil and restful. Every time I go there, I feel refreshed. Another wrote, waking up in the morning and hearing only the birds, no traffic, no construction noises, no music, just the rustle of the wind in the trees and the birds chattering, so peaceful. In their stories, res in their stories residents describe their most memorable Bowen experiences in very similar ways. One spoke of the sounds of Bowen as silence, birdsong and chatter. Another said, all I could see and hear was peace, calm and trees. I knew it was where I wanted and needed to be. <clears throat> Bowen business owners concurred. And one owner talked about how I walk to work. I hear birds, it's fresh and still and beautiful and quiet. I feel relaxed, I arrive and celebrate a new day. And a B&B &B owner, described uh, their greatest pleasure is having people come and experience the still, the quiet, the wild nature that we have. These are just a small sample of many, many, many similar quotes from over uh, 600 uh, points of data. Peace, quiet, tranquility, calm, silence, the soothing sounds of nature. All of these experiences are growing harder and harder to find on the mainland and they are becoming rarer by the day. This highlights their significance as truly valuable assets for Bowen. I firmly believe that allowing motorized recreational vehicles on Crown land trails will put these assets at risk. And this, if these assets are lost, they will be very difficult, if not possible, to regain. So I hope council does again 
recommend that these vehicles be prohibited. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edward. Riley Redhead is next regarding same. Hi. Am I, is my, yeah. You're good, yeah. Hi. Uh, so hello, Mayor and Council. My name is Kylie Redhead and I'm here today to speak hopefully really briefly about the issue of stewardship on Mount Gardner. Uh, Mount Gardner is a sacred space and it deserves our reverence. It also deserves a community who has come together in responsible stewardship, not the kind of stewardship that has been assigned by an outside source, but the kind that is inherent to every human being and not done to further one small group's agenda. We are not Squamish, we are not the Sunshine Coast, we are not Chilliwack, we are Bowen Island and we are unique and we have the right to decide the mountain experience that we as a community want. So if members of the existing coalition are so truly committed to Mount Gardner and trail stewardship as they proclaim themselves to be, then they should still be willing to volunteer and work with the community to care for Mount Gardner, even under the condition of no motorized use. I'm asking the municipality to move forward with your resolution to request the province designate Mount Gardner as prohibited to recreational motorized vehicles. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Oh. Uh, we have Richard Underdown next. Hello, Richard. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Richard Underdown. I'm a 27-year resident of Bowen Island and a regular user of Mount Gardner. I'm aware of the increased dirt biking on the trails, and I'm concerned. The environmental destruction that comes from riding dirt bikes in a fragile ecosystem should be obvious to everyone. It's inescapable. After a quick Google search and reading some background, I fear the island becoming increasingly overrun with dirt bikers. I'm going to try a screen share here to illustrate a point. Richard, you may not be able to. Our permissions are set so that guests can't do that. Um, oh, I was told. Sorry. Okay. So I cannot share slides or any images with you? Uh, Unfortunately, no. I can make you the I can make you the host temporarily, so you can. But I just don't know if we have time for that right now. Uh, I'll defer I'll, to the mayor. I think it'll aid in my presentation, but uh, sorry. Mayor okay. Andrew, uh, what was it depicting, Richard? I'll just have several slides showing stats about. Um, the increased publicity that is being um, brought about. I, I'll, I'll just read what I have here and then. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so after a quick Google search and reading some background, I fear the island becoming overrun with dirt bikers. There are over a dozen videos on YouTube showing Bowen as a place to dirt bike. These are ones listed under BTRA mm -hmm. President Kevin Bernard's Redneck En Route. There's a video showing Bowen Island, Mount Gardner, Canada, and the narrator's voice beckons the viewer by stating, the hardest enduro riding on the West Coast, and nobody knows about it. Kevin said that he is not promoting Bowen as a destination for dirt biking, but these videos are getting thousands of hits. This exposure is having a promotional effect. At the end of one video, he invites viewers to take a quiz and have a chance to get a guided tour. This is promotion. BTRA's Facebook page uh, references a dirt bike clinic held here last May uh, by a well-known woman in dirt biking circles under the name of Meg Rapp. Uh, the Bowen Clinic was advertised in this magazine called Traction E-Rag. It has 27,000 followers on its Facebook page. Uh, I'd show you a picture of her on the cover if I could. Um, apparently the clinic was a big success. She posted about it on her Instagram site, which has 107,000 followers. There are 2.4 million posts on Instagram under the hashtag BRAP, and this is huge exposure. It's being orchestrated by BTRA. Another dirt biker invited over is Tyler Murray, who apparently has won competitions and has a thousand followers on Instagram. It's disingenuous to claim that these videos and posts are not promotional. They're a siren call to dirt bikers. Further, Kevin has said at a meeting that once the signage was up, he had the GPS track ready to email to other outdoor recreational vehicle organizations, and who knows how many this will attract. Anyone searching currently for dirt biking routes on the website Trail Forks will see what I would hope to show you, a, a map 
of the uh, lower mainland, drill down to Bowen, and you'll see highlighted all the trails on Mount Gardner are already designated as dirt bike trails. Bowen is not the back country and Mount Gardner is within 30 kilometers of downtown Vancouver. We don't have miles of roads leading to the wilderness. We're an island and residents live within earshot of Mount Gardner. The vast majority of us value nature and the calming effect of walking through a peaceful forest. This is not possible with dirt bikes on the trails. Bowen has granted itself as a natural escape from city life and ecotourism brings thousands of people to Bowen each year. They come for a tranquil hike and Mount Gardner is the most popular destination. This tourism brings huge economic benefit to the local economy. Indeed, many businesses would not be able to survive without the thousands of ecotourists drawn here each summer. This is in jeopardy with increased dirt biking and I'm concerned about the noise, pollution, safety and sharing the trails. Uh, dirt biking is harmful to the environment and no amount of trail stewardship can undo torn tree roots or damage to threaten ecosystems. And summing up, visitors to the island would be sorely disappointed to be told on one hand that we offer a tranquil retreat and then have to step aside on the trail to let a pack of noisy dirt bikes pass and then smell the lingering fumes. I applaud Council on your unanimous resolution to keep motorized vehicles off Mount Gardner and thank you for <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Richard. Appreciate that. Sorry about the video part. Now I know. <clears throat> next. Sorry, Hope. What was that? Uh, Doug Hardy is just joining now. Okay. Hello. Hi, Doug. Hey, guys. I just uh, wanted to mention about Mount Gardner that I was really disappointed that all this perceived conflict is taken up so much of our valuable time. We all have much, much better things to be doing on the trails and, and in our jobs. I really hope the council would consider moving towards a more collaborative approach to uh, the stewardship on Mount Gardner. I'd also like to thank Councillor Kale for pointing out the obvious bias challenges that you guys are facing on this subject. And that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Claire Weeks is next. Okay. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I, I'm Claire Weeks and I've lived on the island for over 25 years. I'm speaking to you as a long-term avid hiker who loves the peace and beauty of Bowen. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you. You've heard today from a number of people, most of them supporting the prohibition of motorized traffic on Mount Gardner. You've also received over 80 letters from Islanders which express the many reasons why council should support this prohibition and to date, to date as far as I know, none to oppose it. So it must be pretty clear to all of you that many Islanders love Mount Gardner and want to protect it from the damage that would occur if motorized vehicles were allowed. But I would also ask you to refer to a couple of other extremely important sources which I believe should guide you in your decision making, namely our official Community Plan, OCP, and the Parks Plan. Both of these were drafted after extensive and thorough consultation over a period of many months with the entire island population, not even just 80. The Parks Plan was articulated only a year ago, and it was meant to be a plan to guide us through 2028. Going through these documents with a fine-tooth comb reveals many, many references to preserving and supporting the peace and quiet of this island, its ecological wealth, and its value as a place of spiritual renewal. There are many references to keeping the island a haven for hikers and supporting trail building for them. In contrast, there is not a single reference to the need for accommodating the needs of dirt bikers or other users of off-road motorized vehicles, which many argue can only disturb the ecology and the peace of the island. The OCP reflects the values and the vision of the vast majority of Bowenites. The parks plan for 2018 to 2028 ref reflects precisely the same values and the same vision. Council's decision about whether or not to recommend prohibition of motorized traffic on Mount Gardner should also reflect those values and that vision. Thanks very much. Thank you, Claire. Michelle Kapoor is next. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, sorry, I'm on my phone, actually. Um, 
All right, great. Uh, so um, I, I'm just uh, going to comment briefly again. Uh, I'd like to obviously echo what Doug has mentioned, but um, I'd like to offer my perspective. I've been on the island for about six years. Uh, previously, didn't ride dirt bikes when I got on the island um, and was a little bit unsure about the situation with dirt bikes on, on Gardner, you know, not, not really knowing uh, too much about uh, dirt bikes and so on. And, you know, I think I've probably ridden on Gardner maybe six times with a dirt bike, but um, what, what I did notice was over the years, um, there was a lot of uh, fallen trees, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of damage to the trails that since uh, BTRA took over, BTRA started getting involved, uh, started to get cleaned up, and I was appreciative of that. So one thing that I'd like to echo, one thing I'd like to mention is that uh, BTRA has done a lot of work on maintaining the trails, and I'd like to make sure that that would be something that would continue uh, with whoever, whatever stewardship is, 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 uh, is there. Uh, another thing that I, I think that is important to mention is we have, um, there's, there's a lot of mention of, of, of size of groups. And I think that, you know, we have a, we have a small group here and it's important not to quiet them just because they, they are small groups. So I think that as Doug mentioned, having some kind of a proper forum to be able to, to uh, make sure that some of the misinformation that is, that, that is out there is, 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 is addressed you know, not in, not in the form of, okay, well, this has happened, that has happened, but this is actually what the truth is, is very important. So, um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Daxton Curry is next. Okay, thank you. Hi, Daxton Curry here, uh, dear mayor and council. I'm a resident of Bowen Island, a homeowner got multiple businesses servicing the environmental laboratory and testing industry. These are BC registered corporations and they're licensed with Bowen Island Municipality. We work closely with federal, provincial and more local government. I'm the director of one advisory board with Health Canada, working with Natural Resources Canada, Environment Canada, WorkSafe BC and many others, including academic groups. I spent some time reading the collection of letters posted on the municipal site addressed to Tom Blackbird, our council, and other interested parties. It appears that the correspondence is posted, or, or that was posted as a representation of one opinion only. It is comprised of and includes residents, non-residents, off-island groups, and one gentleman that states he's never visited Bowen Island. There appears a glaring omission to any commentary that may be neutral or of a differing opinion. On May 27th, I contacted Municipal Hall and requested further information on this issue. I was given Mayor Anders' email address and I sent a brief correspondence requesting further information on the matter and its stakeholders. I'm yet to receive a response to that correspondence. Okay, sorry. I, okay, I, that's right, you're busy. I oppose a ban on motorized vehicles on Mount Gardner and encourage a further discussion on a plan for shared use. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jackson. Okay, hope is that it? That is all. Okay, thank you. And thank you for all those uh, public comments. Move on to the consent agenda. Uh, Sorry, just anybody... a reminder for everyone who's joined for public comments that our procedure is that you leave and go watch. Um, if you'd like to keep watching, to watch on our YouTube channel, the link to our YouTube channel is on the agenda cover sheet at the top there. So okay. politely, politely kicking you out. <laughs> Thank you, Hope. Okay, the consent agenda, does anybody have, there's just a few items on there. Does anybody have anything they uh, would like to have more have clarification on? Uh, once, twice, three times, okay. Uh, we will adopt the minutes of the consent agenda as uh, by consensus. Thank you. And we'll move right on to delegations. Okay, Kevin Bernard, President. Bowen Island Trail Riders Association. Kevin, are you there? Hello. All right. Thank I'm you. Gotcha. Um, hi, Mayor and Council. Thank you for hearing our delegation tonight. Um, we prepared a video um, as part of this presentation, and uh, I think Hope is you're able to play that for. Going to attempt that now. Just bear with me for one second. Let's try this. OK. 
Can anyone see the video? No. No. Okay. Hmm. Should work. Hang on. While she's working on that, just thank you to all the people who have checked out of the meeting and checked back in on live stream because it means the list that I have to scroll through is now down to <laughs> 20 people to see my fellow counselors and whether they've got their hands up and things. So that's the reason. Thank you. Or one of the reasons. Sorry, I'm just, I'm not sure why it's not showing in my list of files. So let me just try this one. Um, does anyone have any questions for me while we're waiting? Sorry. With yeah, Kevin. Kevin Andrew here. Kevin Bernard's here, Bowen Trail Riders Association can, president. Can you see it? Uh, no. Hmm. I don't know yeah, why you're allowing me to share it. Maybe because it is a video. We haven't done this before. So um, I can play the audio, but I. I can't um, share the video. So I can email it to everyone. I can post it later. I'm not sure what to do in this particular moment. Um, I think we should, uh, if Kevin, and if you uh, agree, I think we should at least do the audio right now. Yeah, I agree. That's fine. Um, okay. okay, I'm going to go use ahead. Use our imaginations. I'm going to go ahead with that now. I can email it to everyone as well. Okay, thank you. Several people spoke out against motorized use on Mount Gardner at the April 27th council meeting. They cited the usual reasons being noise, safety, their ideas of appropriate use, and damage to the environment. Much of this content was speculation and opinion. No facts were provided to back up these claims. And in actual fact, ridership on the mountain is low, which means low impact to motorized use compared to the massive amount of work motorized users contribute. Furthermore, if a section of trail needs repair, trust us, it's on the to-do list. Uh, concerning noise, less sound is more ground. That is our strategy, and so our machines comply with the ORV Act rules and regulations pertaining to operation on Crown land. Uh, conflict. While there has been a lot of conflict on social media lately, there has actually been very little conflict, in my experience, and to my knowledge along the trails. Each encounter I've personally had as both a rider and a hiker have been safe and respectful. Although twice in 10 years, Those there was just something the the there the there oh, Thank you. We are currently developing a trails etiquette guide, which informs the call in varying scenarios. A fun way to test and practice this will be a horse meet moto meet dog style event, which our partners at and will host when safe to do so. Vitra fully supports this and will gladly participate. Uh, regarding the claim of widespread advertising of motorized use on Mount Gardner, uh, this is absolutely not the case. A video of mine was shared as part of a delegate's presentation during the aforementioned council meeting without my consent, uh, with the intent of demonstrating the negative impact and safety concerns related to motorized use on the mountain. What the video actually shows is two riders working together to safely tackle a challenging trail, which is an established and authorized route. Uh, we are not riding off trail. And while I did crash several times, it's important to note that these are low speed incidents. I'm wearing the right gear and was not hurt. The video is over two years old. Since filmed, repairs, reroutes, and upgrades have been made to the trail to make it safer, more sustainable, and to keep riders away from sensitive areas. <coughs> At the end of the clip, I invite other riders to join me. This was meant an invitation, and to be honest, a little bit joke, as this type of riding is not for everyone. Um, this was meant for friends and fellow riders who have shared their riding areas with me in the past. I don't have a big following, and this was targeted at a small group of people. Um, as a result of this invitation, to date, five riders have come over to ride this trail with me. There is no great risk or movement to turn the mountain or Bowen into a destination for motor tourism. 
This is not my goal in sharing these types of videos or photos. I simply wish to show that we share Bones trails along with the other users, and more importantly, that we take great pride in being part of the stewardship of this amazing island. Um, regarding the impact in the street, of the Easy Street, Recreation Sites and Trails BC has hiked the route with us several times over the past two years, early in 2018 and then again late in 2019, along with members of the coalition, and we've discussed on these hikes upgrades to address possible future issues should they arise. No red flags or glaring damage have been noted on Was that the end? Can others hear? I cannot hear. No. I also heard from um, somebody phoned the house, Rosemary Knight phoned the house here. Apparently there's something wrong with the feed and the public can't see or hear the meeting at the moment. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I'm watching the YouTube video right now and I can see it. Um, so I'm not sure, Can were you able to hear the video just now? It cut out part way through. Okay. Um, the audio did, yeah. We never had the video, but the audio cut out too. <laughs> That's what I mean, the audio. Okay, I'm, I'm not really sure what to do. I, I, um, I'm happy to share the video with council after. Kevin, do you mind speaking to the rest of it? I don't want to get... Um, I, I actually watched, I watched that, it's, uh, it's Gary, I watched that presentation earlier um did anybody else watch it well it hasn't been circulated to council yet the video oh okay i i think what betra would like to see is is the video um shared on council's youtube channel and i would like to ask if it would be possible to share the video with the the presentation and the photos um at another council meeting so the public can can view it there i think it i think we're, we deserve the right to be heard here. Um, yeah. and, and for now, I'm happy to answer any questions about our partnership agreement, about the work we've done, um, about our conduct, about how we plan to tackle um, environmental questions, uh, noise, safety, and so on and so forth. So. All right, well, thanks, Kevin. Um, let's see how the questions go. Does anybody have questions? When, what's the uh, status of the coalition, Kevin, at this point? So officially, um, the, the Bowen Island Trail Society announced their withdrawal from the coalition in January of 2019. Um, right. And since we have dissolved the coalition's constitution and bylaws and we're redrafting a new memorandum of understanding right now, um, which <laughs> once signed, um, we'll be looking at renewing our, our partnership agreements. Um, we've got it. We, we have just about a final draft ready to go right now. So hopefully a few weeks. And that would involve the Bowen Island Trail Society, Bowen Trail Riders Association, and Bowen Island Horse Owners and Riders Association. Uh, okay, that's interesting. You think you say those is, is going to come on to this? Um, Trail Society, the Bowen Trail Society. Sorry, uh, is, is Bowen Island Trail Society going to sign on? To the they have all, yeah, um, all communications so far with them um, have indicated that yes, they are willing to sign back because that the partnership agreement is tied to the coalition. Um, if you're not a member of the what was formerly the coalition, you're looking yeah. at independent section 57 applications for every single trail project so if you want to go out and do anything more than light pruning you're you're going through front counter bc for a, a section 57 application okay um, under the section 56 uh partnership agreement that gives us a broader range of, uh, of work that we're able to do without going through front counter but it's still overseen by the province by the district recreation officer so. All right. 
jump in there. I realize what the issue is. Um, when I muted myself, it stopped the audio. So I can finish, the, we can finish the audio of the presentation. And Kevin, I'm happy to upload it to our YouTube channel right after uh, this so that members right. of the public can watch it. Thank you. Safety and signage to help people better find their way. All of this is then presented to our respective boards and coalition partners through documented meetings and emails. And finally, we produce an operating plan based on the outcome of these discussions, prioritizing items and factoring in our aspirations of our organizations and the coalition. Things like promoting safety, sustainability, uh, responsible use, access, transparency, and so forth. Over the past two years of operating under a legal partnership agreement, which gives us permission to work on the trails, Fitcher volunteers have invested nearly 1,000 hours, uh, constructed two multi-use bridges, contributed to the signage and marking, kept the trails clear of blowdown, uh, spent months planning proposals, put in time speaking to other trail users while performing trail work, uh, consulted other similar groups in neighboring communities like the Sunshine Coast, Squamish, and the Fraser Valley. Uh, we've been available to members of the public to discuss our projects, and we have shared details of these with the undercurrent and on our various social media platforms, including Facebook and Instagram, uh, to get the word out and invite those interested in getting involved or to reach out. Uh, We've been developing a communication strategy with our partners to better engage the Bowenami community. Um, we've raised funds for the trails through bottle drives, firewood raffles, and grant applications, all working as volunteers. Um, and we've made every attempt to openly and constructively collaborate with our coalition partners through these quarterly meetings, which often turned into bi-monthly meetings, which often meant weekly phone calls and many, many, many emails. <coughs> In two years, we've done a lot, more than what was expected of us, and we've done it all with all trail users in mind. Um, we're only just getting started, though, and there's still so much more that we want to do on the mountain, and many ways in which we can improve how we operate. Uh, in short, we have conducted ourselves professionally and to the best of our abilities with volunteers. A volunteer base carrying out an immense amount of work on these trails. Um, Victor would like to let our local government know and a move to pursue the action of restricting ORV for motorized use in an area which we have stewarded would be a poor one. And after hearing the reasoning, we believe would be based on assumptions and personal opinion rather than fact. Um, our board would prefer to engage in a constructive, open manner rather than a tired, two sided debate. Uh, this way, all trail users win. And this is what we are hoping for moving forward. Sincerely, Kevin Bernards and the Trail Riders Association Board. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Sue Ellen, you had your name up for a question. Yeah, thank you. I'm, um, I guess my question would be, um, I've, it's interesting that I don't hear any other uh, volunteers on the mountain um, being recognized and yet um, you're saying that the Bowen Island Trails Society will sign, so you're sort of um, talking about them, and yet we've got a letter from them uh, that says, um, as we expressed in our letter to you on 28 January, we found it challenging to collaborate effectively. So I'm wondering, um, how would you describe effective collaboration with other trail organizations? Um, effective collaboration means hearing what everyone has to say. Um, we're focusing on where we come together strongest, and that's on joint projects such as the signage and navigation, um, the bridges, um, improving the trails, making them safer for all trail users. Thank you. Is that it, Simone? Yep. Allison, what have you got? Oh, I wasn't muted. Um, I hope that wasn't me with all the paper rustling background noise. Yeah. Um, it was. <laughs> Anyhow, um, Kevin, um, just a couple of questions. Could sure. you just walk us through or explain um, the process? Of, uh, we've got the partnership agreement. Yeah. And so the coalition sets out a work plan. Um, and then does Parks and Rec sites 
work, come over, visit, look at the work plan, look at the work that's going to be done. Yeah. Um, so as a coalition, um, throughout the year, we would work through our quarterly meetings on developing each organization's operating plan. Um, so we would spitball with one another, um, get a plan together, and then usually at our, our coalition AGM, we would present all our operating plan items and then uh, go through the consensus model and decide which items to adopt into our individual operating plans, which is then uh, overseen and authorized by the province. And just because an item or a project is in an operating plan, it doesn't mean that it's going to come to fruition. Um, each project still requires independent authorization from the district recreation officer. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of things that have to happen there. If you're, if you're breaking new ground or a new trail, there's a whole series of tests, um, but it's all overseen by the province. And what about just regular day-to-day -day maintenance? That's all covered within the regular um, duties of our partnership agreement. Pruning, yes. keeping trails clear, tread, uh, armoring, uh, drainage control, and, and whatnot is all covered. That's Schedule F, I guess, if I'm reading the partnership agreement properly. Yeah. Okay. Is that it, Allison? I think so. Well, I'll reserve the right to come back again. Well, sure. Um, yeah, because nobody else has got their hand up here. Um, well, and I, I just wanted to add one clarification for the general public. Um, several people have written in um, and, and seem to think that um, right now, those they're multi-purpose, multi-use trails, and therefore the use of dirt bikes and motorized recreational vehicles is allowed on the trails. So it's not that they're trying to do something to allow something. Um, That's, yeah, correct. And my understanding from Tom Blackbird, and Bonnie can correct me if she heard differently, that all the trails on Mount Gardner are, multi, are designated multi-use trails. Currently, um, no, there's no yeah. designation, oh, sorry. Sorry, I, I just got an email from Tom and maybe Kevin, you can correct me, but he, he said that there were six in total, six trails that were motorized. Okay. Authorized for motorized use. Okay. How many trails are there? Uh, there's at least uh, oh, 30, 40 kilometers of trails in total on Mount Gardner. But I mean, do it, did, when, when you said, said six trails, do they all have a starting point off land? And, yeah, and he, did, he didn't elaborate on that. He just yeah. said there were six that have been authorized as motorized. That was the, the map we have, one. they're not named and they're not indicated in different colors as different trails. So that would be very interesting from somebody who doesn't like to hike um, okay. to look at. Yeah. So the province is working on developing a map of all the trails right now on Mount Gardner, and that will include um, some of the uses of those trails. Um, and we're also, as a, as a coalition or as an agreement holders, we're working on signage. Um, signage will also give trail users a good idea of, of who to expect or what to expect on certain trails. And I just have to say, like, we're, we absolutely do not want motorized use on all the trails on Mount Gardner. We've identified, um, I think actually five or six trails that are not suitable for motorized use. So we respect um, that there are places for hiking only. Um, and those are quiet places for the hikers to recreate without encountering motorized vehicles. Okay, thank you, Kev. Okay, Allison, last, are you? Uh, one last question. Okay. Um, there's, is there more than one way to get to the top? Uh, but by what hiking? There's probably at least five or six ways to get to the top. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Rob, you got your hand up there. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Uh, Kevin, thanks for being here tonight. Hi, Rob. Um, Kevin, one of the questions. Hey, Kev. Hey, one of the questions we got a lot, or one of the concerns from a lot of the letters, is just the generalized noise. So instead of the trail, you know, conflicts, just the generalized noise of motor bikers going within the area. Um, can you comment on that? Because I would think that, you know, even if you're on trail A and trail B is not motorized, you're still going to have the sound going all over the place. 
place and that being in conflict with people wanting to get out in the forest and listen to nature. So that's been one of the big concerns that's been raised for us. So do you have any comments on that at all? Yeah, so we address in the uh, in the Bitra sustainable trails strategy that I sent in um, to this agenda. Um, we address yep. noise and right now we currently encourage all our club members machines to comply with the 95 decibel limits that's um, typical or common in other riding areas in the province. So that's a measurement taken at I think it, I believe it's two meters from the tailpipe at a certain RPM um, and that's okay. the max decibel reading. So you know, I did a sound test at my house on my bike this weekend, um, and at 50 feet, my bike was at idle, was registering at 55 decibels. So that's quieter than than a normal conversation or background noise or rustling trees or birds, honestly. Um, but there's other things. At, um, there's other things we can do. Um, in terms of noise. And, and one thing that's important to note, um, Tom Blackbird stated that noise is, it's a perceived conflict. It's not actual conflict. So that's something else to remember, but we're definitely conscious of it. And we're definitely trying to encourage our members to, you know, run quieter machines. Um, Thanks, Kyle. Uh, Gary, again, um, um, I just wonder if, what uh, what's your relationship with the province right now? I think they extended your partnership. Okay, so they currently extended uh, our partnership agreement by three months. Um, okay. Things we were set to renew in May, and because yes. of COVID, things were delayed. So um, we're currently oh. we have we have a very good relationship with the province, um, and we're looking at um, hopefully renewing. But I don't I don't have any hard details to give you there yet. So. So you're good till August fifteenth or something now? Somewhere around there, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and if you were going to have a, a, a new contract with uh, BTS and everybody, and actually go back, so you'd be going back into the coalition. Is that what you're saying? We're going to BTS would join them. We're yeah. Um, we're going to be known as the Mount Gardner Agreement or Partnership Agreement holders. Um, I think is the new name. Um, Okay. We would be going back into the into a format similar to the coalition, but um, without constitution and bylaws, we'd be governed by the memorandum of understanding. All right, I check that. Maureen, you've got a question. Yeah, I, I've got a couple, um, Kevin. Um, one is my understanding was that there were some difficulties with the coalition. What's uh, your sense of what uh, resulted in that? Like, why were there difficulties? Um, they, the Bowen Island Trail Society, they wrote in a letter um, to Tom and to, I think, I believe the municipality was copied in that letter. Um, so they've stated their reasons there. I'm not going to go over that. Um, I don't agree that that letter was entirely factual. Um, I can tell you that in our many, many meetings that we've had, um, we definitely have, as different trail users, we have had our differences, but we've always tried, Bitra has always strived to get along and to listen to the other, and to accommodate the other trail user groups. Um, and it was, it was suggested that we didn't agree with the consensus model, and that's not true. Um, we used the consensus model as a coalition um, several times successfully, um, beginning with the forming of our original constitution and bylaws, um, and again with the official naming of many of the trails on Mount Gardner. So, um, so uh, just one more. Sure. So with the province, um, proceeding with the province uh, would be as a coalition. It, that's that's what it means to be to have a partnership agreement. It means right. that. It's multiple organizations um, partnered with the province, yes. So can you tell me why you think now that it's possible to go ahead with a coalition when so, it seems like you're still at odds with others in the coalition? So Tom Blackbird, in our, in our last meeting um, in person here in January, he stated that even with bits withdrawing from the coalition, um, by Hora and Bitra could continue as a coalition and we could look to fill Bits's place with a new group. And we've, so we've been reaching out to, there's other groups on the island that are interested and we're definitely open to that. Um, we've been, re we've reached out. I personally have 
been reaching out to the mountain bikers and we're trying to get some some official recognition and representation there. Um, okay, thank you for your answer. Yeah. All right, any further questions for Kevin? Um, there, there might have been a suggestion, Kevin, that um, if you moved off Mount Gardner, you could go over to Radar Hill or something. And what would be your th thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, as as legal partnership agreement holders for Mount Gardner, um, and yeah. they worked so hard there for two years, um, moving over to another area doesn't really seem reasonable to me at this time. But um, we're hoping, like we do, even though we're not agreement holders for that area around Radar Hill, we still, um, you know, we've, we've worked with the province um, in that area before in terms of posting up signage around Ferry Fen, and we, we still keep those trails clear. Um, we do a lot of work there, so um, hopefully maybe one day that's something we can bring into our current agreement. But. All right, well, thank you. If nobody's got any other comments, thank you very much, Kevin. That was very forthcoming, and uh, it was, uh, it was a pleasure to have you here, and I thank you for your participation. Thank you for your time, Gary and Council. Thank you. All right. Bye, um, so we're going to move on to uh, business arising from the minutes. And it's a request to uh, prohibit recreational motor motorized vehicle use on Mount Gardner, Bonnie Brokenshire, Manager of the Environment and Parks Planning. Bonnie, are you with us? I am. Thank, okay, thank, thank you. you. Over to good, you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So a bit of background why I'm presenting this report tonight at Council's April 27th, 2020 meeting. Council passed resolution number 2232 which states that council support prohibiting motorized use on Mount Gardner and that council directs staff to prepare a submission to Tom Blackbird Recreational and Recreation and Trail Sites BC requesting the prohibition of motorized use on Mount Gardner. Subsequently, at the May 25th, 2020 meeting, council passed uh, another resolution, resolution number 2276, which states that council deferred the motion raised by Councillor Fast at the May 25th, 2020 council meeting seeking to have council request that Islands Trust support Bowen Island Municipality in its efforts to oppose any recreational use of motorized vehicles on Mount Gardner Crown lands. Defer that to the June 8th meeting. And um, and June 8th, 2020 open council meeting and that the draft staff letter be submitted to Tom uh, Blackbird or the, sorry, the draft staff letter that is um, to be submitted to Tom Blackbird be included in the June 8th, 2020 open council meeting as well. Hence um, the draft letter uh, written by staff is in your agenda package tonight. And so the, the resolution that's before council or the recommendation that's before council tonight is whereas council passed resolution number 2276 at its May 11th, 2020 meeting requesting that the province prohibit motorized vehicle use on Mount Gardner. Therefore be it resolved that council approve the draft letter dated May 20th, 2020 that outlines rationale for prohibiting recreational motorized use on Mount Gardner Crown Land Polygon to be signed under the mayor's signature and submitted to Tom Blackbird, Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development, uh, District Recreation Officer, and that council requests that Islands Trust support Bowen Island Municipality in its efforts to oppose recreational use of motorized vehicles on Mount Gardner Crown Land Polygon. So that's the recommendation before council tonight. The draft letter, the draft uh, letter that was um, written by staff is, is uh, included in the package. Um, so I, I just, I open, I'm finished with my recommendation and uh, you know, if there's any questions about the content of the letter or any other questions that council have, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try to answer those to the best of my ability. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. Uh, mm -hmm. Does anybody have anything? Uh... Anything to ask Bonnie? Mm. Are we muted here? 
No? Councilor Hawking has his hand okay. up first. I can't seem to get my... Okay, I got it there. David Hawking. Uh, thank you, Gary. And um, uh, Kevin, thank you for your presentation. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the passion that you bring to this and, uh, and also the words from Vishal, Daxton, and, and Doug. Um, but I, I really strongly support the letter uh, that Bonnie has written. I think she's made the arguments quite clearly. And I think some of the other speakers and the letters have made the arguments quite clearly as well, is that, is that motorized biking and hiking on a, in a quiet mountain area a quiet natural area that they just are not compatible. It's not compatible with the Bowen brand. It's not compatible with the expectations of the, um, well, 78% of the people, maybe 20,000 people who expect to go to Mount Gardner as, as visitors. Um, and and, and um, because for those people, you know, they've hiked through Crippen Park and they probably don't realize they've even left Crippen Park. So they expect the same kind of experience that you would have in a Bowen Park or a Crippen Park, which is the protection of nature and the, the connecting people to, to um, uh, with nature, with the natural world. And I, I should note that a similar problem has arisen in um, Belcara Park, where Metro Vancouver had an arrangement with a dirt bike group because it was a remote part of the park. And uh, as people, as, as more and more hikers were, were um, looking for places to get into the backcountry in, in uh, the Metro Vancouver region. There was conflict between the dirt bikers and the hikers and, the, uh, and, and, and some just plain old bicyclers. And so the, the license for the dirt bikers has been removed. And the two are just not compatible. And um, the use of dirt bikes on Radar Hill, um, the trails have been well developed. I looked at the map that's been presented and, and uh, um, dirt bikers can use all sorts of trails there and get into all kinds of areas and activities that they like. Uh, but uh, for Mount Gardner, where it's for most people, it's um, a, a place for quiet as various of our speakers explained, and a quiet and connection to nature, the, the sound, the erosion, um, and the, the speed and the safety issues, uh, they are just not compatible. So I support the letter that uh, the original motion and I support the letter that Bonnie has written. I think she did a good job um, ex expressing the reasons why motorized use on Mount Gardner trails is not appropriate. Thank you. Okay, thank you, David Allison. Okay, um, so just sort of a couple of things. Um, go back to the legislation. Um, Section 14 of the Interpretation Act has not been mentioned in staff's report anywhere. Um, and it basically, you know, I guess simplistically sort of says that our rules have no effect for the province. So that's why the province wouldn't have taken out DPs or done anything like that. Um, if you go and look at the section 58 order, um, they're required pursuant to the regulations to start a whole separate process of consultation. So when you issue a section 58 order, it has to be done pursuant to a public consultation process. And a letter writing campaign to us, I don't think fits in the definition of a public consultation process. So the province would have to start that. Um, Recreation Sites and Trails BC is in the process of doing us, well, they've just done some public surveys and now they're doing local government surveys, but they're doing a review of their trails plan. So I don't know why they would wanna start a small separate side process while that was going on. And then if there are trails that right now are considered walking, hiking only and not dirt bike use or motorized use. Um, and, you know, I talked to a few people that have sort of said they use the trails all the time and they've never run into a motorized vehicle. So um, I'm just wondering if we're going to get anywhere with the letter. And, um, and my other concern is, 
if in reading a lot of what's in the letter and the comments about watershed and environmental damage, well, horses can damage and bike, mountain bikes can damage and 50 people walking up a trail can damage. So the letter seems to be putting forth a case to have no activity on the trails on Mount Gardner. So um, at this point, and also given the fact that we didn't get to see the video, um, I don't think we should be proceeding with this resolution at this time. For all, all of right. the above reasons. Is that it, Allison? Yeah. Okay, Sue Ellen. Thank you very much. I'm um, going to be speaking in favor of the motion. And um, I'm, um, I'm thinking about all the volunteer groups who've worked on the mountain uh, for the past uh, 25 plus years that I've lived on Bowen, uh, including uh, North Shore hikers and other groups uh, from off island and various people have come and gone. And I really appreciate all the time and energy that all those groups put in and uh, including um, the ones currently involved, the Hora and BITS and BITRA. Everybody has a part to play and they're all important. Um, I'm gonna speak uh, a little bit about, I think what we're facing here is a change or a proposed change in land use. And um, we're the uh, local government authority about land use. So I think this is really appropriate that we're taking the time to think about it. Um, this was a hiking trail when it was back approved by the Ministry of Forest from one of the letters that we received from Everhard Van Lith the Yoda, who built the trails with um, um, public dollars. It was federal dollars during an uh, unemployment uh, work program uh, one summer in the 80s, and they were designed as hiking trails. And this is a professional forester who designs trails for forest uh, roads for forestry companies uh, at the time. So he would have designed these for um, low impacts. As he said in his letter, the steep slopes and the uh, sides. Anyway, it, they're designed as hiking trails. And I gather from uh, another communication that we received that they were um, uh, approved as such by the Islands Trust. It was before the municipality and the Islands Trust was the local land authority at that time. And, uh, and they, um, there was a lot of discussion about whether it would be approved as, uh, it, it was approved as hiking trails is what I gather. Anyway, so why now um, are there in this shared use agreement, it says uh, that BITRA will be responsible for those trails that are principally motorized trails. I'm not sure how that came to happen. Apparently Tom Blackbird got a hold of Bonnie and said there were six of those. And, um, but I, I'll just continue quickly. Um, current, the current way the trails are used as hiking trails is good for Bowen. And we've got all those visitors coming here and the businesses that were mentioned by, by Ed Walkman in his presentation, uh, low impact businesses, residents and um, visitors. None of these have been, uh, uh, taken into account in the partnership agreement or um, it seems to me their input is needed too. And we have that through the branding exercise, also through to some degree, the parks plan. And of course our official community plan. Um, I won't go into that very much except to say tourism stats said, you know, something like 70% uh, of visitors come for parks and trails. And uh, there were some stats in the other letters and in Bonnie's excellent letter. Um, so I, I just think the user experience is very important. That's what um, our product is, if you want to think about it from a um, tourism point of view. And um, I don't uh, think we should be changing that. And that's why I'm for the prohibition. I also, just a couple of other thoughts. Um, we're investing public dollars into a very expensive water treatment plant downhill climate change is coming, why would we um, not prohibit something that would bring more erosion uh, to the mountain? Um, even if they fix it afterwards, I think uh, there's general agreement that motorized vehicles cause uh, erosion, certainly from the photos I've seen and from walking around on Radar Hill, which I've done in other years, there's a big network of trails there, off-road vehicle trails, hardly any hikers. And uh, 
Bowen's, um, Bonnie's report covers the parks plan and the OCP and development permits. And I wonder if we shouldn't be uh, thinking about formalizing our agreement by asking Parks, Trails and Greenways Association, our advisory committee, I mean, um, perhaps they would like to be part of a coalition or some other group, some way to formalize uh, municipal um, interests and uh, um, guidance or direction. The, the, the official community plan directs the community to create an island-wide network of trails and uh, the parks plan and the OCP and all these other documents have many things in there about protecting the environment. And I think now during COVID, we need to think about both local businesses. Uh, we need to think about uh, everybody from bed and breakfast to, to restaurants and that kind of thing. We need to think about um, the healthy, peaceful getaway we are um, for um, our, our residents, of course, and uh, later on that we may be for um, other people in the province. So I just think that focus on health uh, is really appropriate at this time. And I'd like to hold the line on our current land use um, unless they want to go through a rezoning process or something more appropriate. And um, so that's why I'll be voting in favor of uh, the motion. Thank you. I'm done now. Thank you, Sue Ellen. Michael. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank a couple of groups for all those people who took the time and the trouble to write. I'd like you to know, and I think I'm speaking for my colleague councillors, that we actually did read all those letters and no one's under any doubt there's a great many of them, but we actually, I can speak for myself, I certainly did read those letters. I, I also would actually like to thank the presentation made this afternoon by the uh, Trail Riders Association because I think, I think the individuals are quite genuine and uh, believe in their sport and wish to do everything in a proper and correct way. The issue in front of council right now is we have, as we've had before, and one notable example quite recently, a case of almost irreconcilable differences here. Uh, it is a fact that a great many people on this island heartily oppose the use of motorized vehicles on Mount Gardner. And, and I can say truthfully, I'm not surprised. And why not surprised? Because I was one of the people who were part of the original branding exercise. The original branding exercise gave me and some others a privilege of not just listening to the, was it 80 people who wrote or 50 people who, 80 people who wrote, I forget because I read so many letters, but all of but we, we, we had a chance to be involved in, in many, many cross sections. And I'm going to take one of our earlier speakers points that what is it that defines us is probably going to be have to have to be something that council defends. And council, uh, we, we are defined uh, as explained in our branding exercise. Ed Watchman laid it out perfectly in terms of what it is we stand for. And therefore, my opinion is as council, recognizing we're faced with these two opposing forces, we're going to have to look for the future, what is good for the community and what is good for the broader community and the visitor community. And uh, I, I, for one, I'm going to support uh, Bonnie's letter because having been part of that branding exercise, I'm under no doubt at all that motorized terrain vehicles really emotionally have no place within the psyche of Bowen Island. And that is the, what I have to take forward when I think of about this, I hope in an unbiased and considered manner. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. Maureen? I think Michael just stated everything that I would have wanted to state here. Um, I, I do appreciate the, uh, the passion and the, uh, the integrity with which people have spoken uh, to, this, to this issue, but I also support Bonnie's uh, correspondence and the initial 
uh, recommendation that we, we passed. I don't think the questions about whether we will get anywhere with the letter are, are particularly useful to consider. It was made very clear to us when we spoke with Tom Blackbird that in this scenario, he is the decision maker. And what our role is as a municipal council is to express on behalf of the community what's in the best interest of the community. That's all. Thank you, Maureen. David? Thanks, Gary. I just want to express one more thought. So, um, and I thought, uh, Michael, you did a lovely job saying some things that I was trying to say. Um, one of the things that really concerns me here is the Crown lands are a really important part of Bowen Island. They're, they're the heart, they're right in the middle. They're the, they're the core of the island in many ways. They provide the, the natural environment for all sorts of creatures that we like to see and, and hear. Uh, they provide our water source and they provide uh, that sort of the quiet backdrop for all of us. And it concerns me a whole lot that decisions about the use of our Crown lands are being taken without consideration by organizations that are, have been elected or, or are part of our municipal um, governance. These Crown lands are entirely within Bowen Island, not like any other communities where the Crown lands go you know, back miles off into the wilderness. This is a, a really important part of Bowen and I just don't like the idea of, I don't at all agree with the idea of, of the province deciding important things about how our crown lands are used without that coming to council, without that coming to our municipal staff. Uh, well, that's a good point, David, but that's, that's, that's the way it is, unfortunately. Uh, just a few comments before we uh, we carry on here. I don't see anybody else up there. Um, She's got her hand up. Who? Who? Bonnie. Okay. She, yeah. Okay. Bonnie, go ahead. I just wanted to say that I think in my last year, and well, since I got back from Laos, um, so since this last year, 2020 anyway, a little bit of late 2019. Tom Blackbird and I have started to talk quite a bit more. And, um, you know, he, I think he's open to um, supplying operational plans or having more of a dialogue and interaction with the municipality. Perhaps at least that's sort of our correspondence back and forth. You know, um, we're establishing it. I wouldn't say that it's fully established, but um, I think there is more information sharing now. And I think that just the issues at hand have highlighted the need. I think for him, he realizes too, that maybe that, you know he needs to um, consult with staff at least and let us know what's going on. So I'm hopeful about our course, our communication improving. Thanks, Bonnie. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. Yeah, so, you know, just how do we get here? We had a presentation by, um, the bone trail trail uh, trail people um, rosemary knight which had a video in it which was uh, very explosive and i think the whole of council came out of that feeling a little bit uh shell-shocked to tell you the truth and we voted this resolution through and and in retrospect i i started thinking well how come we only heard one side of this program um and one side of the argument when how can we make a possible decision on only hearing one side. So at that point, uh, we got the trail riders um, involved and they were gonna make a presentation anyway, but they they obviously put it together and, and made that presentation. And uh, we got their side of, of what they do up there. They do a tremendous amount of work up there and that sort of thing. And, um, uh, but there is a definite conflict. There's absolutely no question. And it might be irreparable. I um, I would probably I'm going to vote to continue with the uh, with the letter to uh, Tom Blackbird and see what he thinks. We also they have, as we discussed, they've got till uh, mid August to put a coalition together, and if they can put a coalition together, and a lot of those people who wrote letters are part of the Bowen Island Trail um, Society, and they can agree on some mixed use. Mount Gardner, then they're, they're certainly willing to implement a uh, plan. And we only have, as council, we only have a very limited input into this, a very successful letter rating campaign. 
and um, and we'll see where it goes with the province. So uh, I, I had a little bit of uh, issue with uh, inclusion. This has always been part of Bowen Island and now the uh, we're all of a sudden not including the trail riders and um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Maybe there's an option for them to ride somewhere else on the island that wouldn't be quite as um, disruptive in some people's minds. So I'd be, uh, I'm certainly prepared to move this along and uh, we'll, we'll send it on to, we'll send it on to uh, David Blackbird and see how he, uh, Tom Blackbird and see how he responds. So, um, uh, does anybody, the only thing I would change in that recommendation, uh, because one thing I did notice in all those letters, and I read every one of them, probably 80% of the letters, which is very interesting, uh, indicated that they didn't, they didn't understand that there was no, uh, that there was motorized vehicles on Mount Gardner to this point. So they were not even aware that the, the motorized vehicles had been operating for two or three years or 10 years, however long they've been up there. So that was interesting. They thought it was going to be a new thing. So that's very interesting as far as the, uh, the uh, input there. Anyway, um, the only thing I would share is therefore be it resolved council approved the draft letter dated May 20th, 2020 that outlines rationale for prohibiting. And I would like to put uh, continuing recreational motorized use on Mount Gardner because that's what it is. It's not prohibiting and it's prohibiting the continuation of recreational. I don't know if people have an objection to that or not. Anybody out there, Sue Ellen? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's clear the way it's stated here, Gary, in that uh, prohibiting recreational motorized use is nice and clear, and it fits with what we said earlier. And I think it'll be clear to everybody uh, through the years as well. Yeah, I just I just want to make sure everybody understands we're taking away something that was there, and it's not something new. That's that was my. That was my take on that. I don't know. How does everybody else feel? I'm, I'm easy on it either way. I support going with the original. Okay. Allison? That's written. Well, I, like, I said, um, I'm not sure that I'm happy with the process. And I've got a number of issues with the wording in the letter itself. And um, also, I think if we're going to have a resolution to, um, right to Tom Blackbird, then I think we better have a resolution to amend the land use bylaw because the land use bylaw allows biking and the dictionary definitions of bike and biking include motorcycle. Well, Bonnie's got her hand up. Okay, Bonnie, go ahead, sorry. Um, as far as I understand, and I'm, you know, I would have to look into that a little bit um, more, Allison, but I have peripherally look, looked into that. And Daniel is currently doing some uh, definition amending, some sort of housekeeping and definition amendment. And yes, you're correct in that biking is not um, defined. So it could be defined in as, as planning staff is already working on definitions and that would tighten it up. Biking could be defined as non-motorized bikes. But that is not necessary at this point in order no. for forward. Yeah. Okay, so I'll... I'd like to move the motion. Okay. So I'll read it out. Whereas council adopted, well, Bonnie read it out already, but Bonnie I'll read, read it, it out. out. As written. As written. I'd like, I move this motion as written. Okay. That's second. Right. I'll second. Yeah. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Zero. Okay. Thank you. That is unanimous. No, it's not. Well, I asked the post. I, was, I stuck my hand up. Well, I saw, not, I saw, he I can't, can't see it. you. Yeah. You Got to say something. My hand okay, is so. very visible. Councillor think... Councillor Morris in opposition. Then thank you. Let's move on. Thank you. All right. So uh, the next one is uh, five point two support regarding uh, Mount Gardner trails, which doesn't uh, are you happy to leave that out now so 
jump in that that was just included because we have a council uh, resolution to bring that back to this meeting. Um, I think that it's probably not necessary now given the motion that was just adopted. Correct. You're happy with that, Suella? That's fine. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go to bylaw 6.1, the Bowen Island official community plan amendment bylaw number 498-2019 in Bowen Island land use bylaw amendment bylaw number 499. 2019, uh, the RZ03 2019, the OCP02 2019, 720, Gardner Lane. Daniel Martin, Manager of Planning and Development. Thank you, Daniel, if you're here. Daniel, would you like me to share it? Would you like to share it? Um, does it work if I share it? Yep, you should. Am, am I able to? Should be. I think I gave you permission. There you go. Give it a whirl. It's still saying you've disabled participant screen sharing. Ah, it's saying that I can allow it. So uh, here, let's try that. Okay. Can you try now? Yeah, that should do it. Okay, perfect. Does that work? Can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, Mayor and Council, as, as Mayor Andrew had said, we're here talking about 720 Gardner Lane. Um, and so bylaws 489 and 490. Um, so for those who don't remember, this is the property located in roughly the center of, of Bowen Island. And here it is. Do you see my, my cursor as well? Yes. I, yes. Highlight? Okay, excellent. Yeah. Um, so it's a 20 acre or eight hectare parcel. Um, located right at the foot of Mount Gardner off of Grafton Road. So it's accessed off of Gardner Lane, which is this little laneway here, or off Buchanan Road on this side. Um, and then it backs onto, this is the Crown Land through this triangle. Um, in the OCP, it's designated as Rural Residential, or RS, um, which has this minimum average parcel size of one hectare. And in the land use bylaw, it has a split zone of RR2 and RR3. Um, which is our rural residential zoning. Um, and so between these, these two different split zone designations, um, the subdivision of this lot without a rezoning could allow for one lot, one 10 acre lot zoned RR2 and two five acre lots zoned RR3. Um, so what's proposed before you, the proposal is, is to rezone. So I should try to move. Um, so to rezone a four hectare partial portion of the property to be rural commercial two to allow a retreat center to go forward um, to create zoning to allow two residential lots of one hectare in size each so that's to reduce the the lot size to allow these smaller lots um, and to provide a two hectare park dedication so on february 10th of this year council gave first reading to the two bylaws so 498 to amend the official community plan and 499 to amend the land use bylaw um, and referred the bylaws to the Advisory Planning Commission, the Parks, Trails, Greenways Advisory Committee, and the Islands Trust, and advised the applicant to hold a public open house. So the Islands Trust has commented that both of these bylaws are not contrary to or at variance with the Islands Trust policy statement. The Advisory Planning Commission supported the bylaws um, with two recommendations. So one, that uh, physical and legal connection be maintained between the retreat center and the park dedication and that the future development of those two residential lots be developed according to conservation development principles where approximately 50% of the land be preserved as natural space. And the Parks Trails Greenways Advisory Committee um, endorsed the proposed dedication of the two hectares of public park on the western edge of the property along with the riparian protection area on the southeast corner of the property. Um, and we had an open house. Our open house was originally scheduled to take place in about mid-March um, and we had to cancel that. And so all, instead we held a virtual open house um, in the end of April. So municipal staff and the applicant participated with three members of the public and we gave an overview and, and staff and the applicant answered questions from the public. Um, finally, since that February 10th council meeting, the municipality has received a number of letters from the public on the proposed rezoning. So 36 letters to date, um, 34 of them support the proposal. So common themes in the letter support are support for retreat centers on Bowen, support for the work done by the applicants, um, and support for the proposed park dedication 
The letters of support also reference um, an online petition that has um, been circulated and the link is in one of the letters. Um, so concerns raised are from the immediate neighbors um, who both state you know, support for the overall concept of the rezoning, but concern about um, trespass from retreat centers guests. Um, and then and more other comments saying desire for staff housing to be built as part of the development and a desire for the, see the land dedication be available for future affordable housing projects as well instead of um, just for park dedication. So staff has taken um, the comments made by council at the last meeting made by the advisory um, advisory committees, the referrals, um, and has brought the, the bylaws back for consideration of second reading, but with a series of conditions that would be captured through um, a covenant and so would be a condition of the rezoning going forward. Um, so I just um, had a list of them here. They're in the report, but I wanted to, to go through them all. So the first would be an east side trail easement. So this would be an easement running along this east side of the property um, to serve as future connections. So either um, to the property of the north if that ever came to rezone or these properties to the east to connect to um, future trail networks going this way. And the second, uh, riparian area protection area, um, riparian area protection regulation covenant area. So protecting the riparian area um, in the bottom corner of their property. The third is that two hectare park dedication on the west side of the property. Um, the fourth is then a trail contribution connecting Buchanan Road with the Crown land. And the fifth is then a protective covenants on lots one and two. So that's as um, proposed by the APC. And so that would be a covenant that would say that at time of subdivision of those lots to create those individual lots, um, that a future covenant would have to be placed protecting 50% of the site. So the applicant supports the, the concept of it and saying that areas of those lots would be protected from development or from disturbance. Um, but until time of coming for subdivision, they don't yet know where exactly the access roads would be, where the, the water or the septic or the building sites would be best located. Um, so what the APC had recommended and what the applicant supports is, is sort of a blanket covenant at this point that says, okay, when that, when that subdivision comes, those lots are created, that's when they would have to determine, okay, this is where the septic field would be, this is the building site, this is the road access. And so this would be the covenant area that would protect um, the remainder of the lots. Um, so number six, again, this is the APC looking for that internal park access. So from the retreat center to the park site and then to the crown land. Um, and so then the final thing to discuss, this was mentioned in one of the letters and staff are still investigating is, is this road access on the Western side of the property? So on our mapping, this area is shown as a road that runs, that continues from Buchanan Road and to connect to the crown land. Mm -hmm. um, but what one of the letters has stated and what, there's this old plan that shows it as a separate piece. Um, and so while it doesn't show up on BC assessment as a separate property, we were able to locate a um, property identification number. So a PID number for the property indicating it as a separate parcel. It is essentially a um, nine meter wide strip that runs through the whole thing. Right away. As I say in the report, we've contacted BC Assessment looking to have it identified if it is a parcel to have it added um, to our tax rule, which it's not at the moment. Um, and BC Assessment has come back to me and they said, well, they think that it is a road. They don't identify it as a property. Um, and so uh, municipal staff and BC Assessment are working with the land title agency to try to determine the status of, of what exactly this, this piece is, the sort of forgotten leftover piece. Um, so what I have proposed with the applicant is that in the meantime, we would propose essentially an access route. So that's this green route of a public access route for um, the public to still access from a municipal park to the proposed municipal park. Um, and then an orange line that would be staff access to the municipal park as well. Um, if machinery or whatever it needed to get there to visit the park would be, that would be the, um, the municipal access route to the park. It's still, you know, I, I still can't determine exactly the status of this, this property and it may well turn out to be road or be um, road in the, you know, the municipality can, can assume ownership of it. But, um, but in the event that that's not possible, we, we'll sort of try to think through some of the options. Um, and so then the, the recommendation in the report is that the two bylaws before you be read a second time and that they be referred to a public hearing. All right, is that it, Daniel? That's it. I'm open for any questions. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I guess my first question would be, uh, what about the current um, driveway into the place? Is that not usable? Is it is there illegal for some reason? Um, in terms, so there's access off of Gardner Lane. Yeah, that's established, and it's more the access on the western side, and it's primarily then uh, it's access to the park. Okay. All right. Okay. That's good clarification. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Hold on. I'll just bring up the screen here. We've got Sue Ellen first. Yeah, thank you. Um, my question is a, a quick one. I think you may have answered it, but um, in about the covenant, uh, would this covenant protect 50% of the site is what it says in your report. Is it in the natural condition? Is it like a, a conservation covenant? Yes. Do you mean? Yeah, it would be a conservation covenant similar to we have on a number of lots like we have for the Josephine Lake. Um, for example, through that rezoning, you know, okay. the stuff beside the lake would be natural state. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to confirm that. Thank you. Uh, David? Thanks, Gary. And thank you, Daniel. Um, I, I support this. Um, I'm prepared to move it if need be. Um, I think the, the proponents have done a good job uh, with the work that they've done, the way they've laid this out. And I think Daniel has done a great job listening to the feedback from the various groups um, and uh, integrating that into what we have before us. So I think uh, um, I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, David. And Maureen. Um, I would like us to consider um, doing another site visit to, uh, to the property, in part because I'm having, I'm having trouble with two things. I'm having trouble uh, imagining the access uh, off of Buchanan Road. Uh, if that is what we're going to end up with. Buchanan Road, as you know, is like that. Um, and if we're going to be going even farther up Buchanan Road, I'm curious about how that would work. I also am um, a bit concerned about the proposed location uh, of the, uh, the trails. Um, the topography of that site is quite mixed and uh, I just would like to have another look at uh, what that parkland uh, is going to uh, going to look like, and what kind of access it might provide in the longer term to um, uh, the de facto uh, Mid Island Trail. I know the area really quite well. Um, I used to live in that area, and uh, getting around in that that area can be uh, fairly tricky. And the concerns that were brought up by, um, I believe it was Mr. Lodge, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lodge, who owned the 40 acres at the end of Harding Road, raised some flags for me that perhaps even the owners of, um, of the proposed um, prop, proposed redevelopment at, at, um, at Gardner, that they may not be fully aware of where the lines are drawn. All right, does anybody else feel uh, that way? Allison? I've got my hand up for nothing to do with another walkabout, but okay. that is one of the things I think was because it's such a big piece of property um, and it's accessed off sort of an end of Adams, Grafton Road, we're missing a map that shows us the back piece and just how the property fits in relation to its, its other pieces. But um, Maureen, were you finished? Yeah, I, I am, and, and the point that you're making is is one that I would really support. Yeah, so I was just calling out a, a map that I had sitting here just to have a look at the backside. Um, we're being asked to do second reading and take it to public hearing, correct? Correct, yep. Okay, so um, I guess my whole issue is the, the clauses of the covenant. I'm not totally clear what happens. I've, I've been looking at my maps in the... Um, the Buchanan rezoning file that I had, and it's described that funny little strip is described as the remainder of district lot B. Um, and it's got a plan reference number, which I can't read, it's too small to type. But um, so what happens if it turns out that that is a private piece of land held by somebody? Um, I've got a handwritten note in my file for somebody else had written on the, the map that it's crown. Um, 
what, how do they access those lots through the um, trail that's, you can't put your map back up, I guess, can you? I'm sure. Yeah. Well, we've got it. Here, let me try to find. Well, they, the agenda. They come in from, I, mean, I guess I'm just worried that a covenant is going to be put on that will make it impossible for them to access the lots. And the park access is to be off Buchanan Road, but if Buchanan Road ends, you know, it's a pinpoint on a map, the corner. So um, there's a private lot below it. So I just don't, I don't think we have to sort it out tonight, but I guess I'm just concerned that the covenant might be locking them into something that maybe could, should just be dealt with at the time of subdivision road access to the property in the parks when the subdivision is done. Yeah. Daniel, what's which, your thought on that? Yeah, sorry, Allison, which part of the, the covenant are you are you referring you to? You said something about the covenant for road, for access to the two new lots? Yes, I mean, the applicant has proposed the two new lots would come off of that. But you know, there's that, no that road piece. there. Yeah, so there's no road there. So I mean, what happens if there isn't a way to access that side? Yeah, and then essentially, yeah, then the legal access would come off of Gardner, right, okay. and he would probably be doing the two lots as a three lot strata subdivision with a strata road. Okay, so we're we're not with the draft covenant that you're proposing, locking him in to Mount to Buchanan Road, and then we'd have to go and release a covenant so that he could get access them elsewhere. No, what I see would change is that if, you know, if, if public hearing, if we come to their covenant and we haven't sorted out definitively that this is a road, it would be this covenant that says there's still public access to the park area um, and there's still municipal access through his site to the park area. Yeah, and he has um, And we would include some language in there about, you know, if alternate access opens up, which means, you know, if this, if this opens up as an access route. Okay. So we, I haven't, I mean, you haven't given us the actual covenants, just some no. suggested topic no. that they would cover. So I guess that was sort of part of the question is to, uh, I can understand why you want to access the park off Buchanan Road. And I can understand why he wants to access lots one and two, but are, we're not requiring a covenant that he has to access lots one and two from Buchanan Road. No. Okay, thank you. I'm quite in favor of giving it second reading and going to public hearing. Okay. With uh, the map, sorry, who else do we have on the list here? Uh, Michael? Michael um, first. He, yeah, uh, I, I'm in favor actually of moving this uh, forward if everyone has agreed. I don't want to prevent someone who's saying, look, I really need to see this again, but it's going through for public hearing and maybe we have time to make a visit before that. Going back to the original, uh, <laughs> The much referred to uh, Ed Watchman this, this, this evening, when we were talking about tourism and we were doing the branding exercise, this type of, uh, this type of activity was one I believe was generally, if not specifically envisaged. So I support it because I think it's compatible with the vision we were trying to establish in that branding exercise. And I, and I think it's complementary to us as a, as a community and and I and I and I would be very supportive in seeing it go ahead if anybody would want to uh, to review the actual piece of land again I, I, I have no wish to dissuade that but I, I definitely am supportive of this moving to uh, public hearing all right thanks Michael Sue Ellen um thank you I'm uh, I would love to have um, a site visit of the access points and uh, the corners, you know, where to make sure we can get into the uh, crown land if that, anyway, I just wanna see the lay of the land. And uh, when we had our other site visit, <clears throat> um, it was uh, a short and uh, we could kind of see the, the main uh, sort of already disturbed area, uh, but I have not been able to be up on the, on the air on the land either. That doesn't have to be part of a site visit. I can do that on my own or with another counselor who might want to join me or something. But uh, I would particularly like to see the access points. Other than that, I don't have a, 
I know, um, you know, retreats like this, healthful retreats are part of our official community plan and that was uh, uh, supported and uh, I like the park dedication and I'm, uh, I'm in support of this. I would just like to have a walkabout beforehand so that we can interpret the comments that come. Um, okay, thank you, Sue Ellen. Um, Daniel, do you, um, do you feel that uh, moving this to second reading is, is premature before somebody has a walk around? I can't do a walk around through there, but whoever wants to do it, do you think that uh, would be okay? I'd like to move this along. Um, it's been bouncing here back and forth for probably about three or four months or more now. And um, I think we gotta, we gotta start narrowing this down. What do you think, Daniel? I mean, I brought it for second reading, but you know, if council want, needs a, um, a site visit before, we can arrange that, or if council wants to give it second reading now, and then I can commit to, to scheduling a, a site visit for as many councillors who want to come before a public hearing. I'm sure we can schedule that. That would be fine. Yeah, I'd be happy with that. Maureen, you okay with that? Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to give it second reading and, and sit in the site visit, yeah. just to clarify some of the questions that it sounds as though Perfect. Alan and I Perfect. share. All right. So on that note, I will move the bylaw number 498-2019 cited as one on official community plan amendment bylaw number 498-2019 be read a second time. And the bylaw number 499-2019 cited as Bone Island Land Use Bylaw Amendment bylaw number 499-2019 be read a second time. And council refer bylaw number 498-2019 and bylaw number, by number 499-2019 to a public hearing. Okay. Thank you, Allison. You got a second on that? Second. Okay, thanks, David. And okay, uh, any further discussion? I'll ask a question all in favor. Aye. 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 Oh. You got him? You happy, Hope? Yes. Uh oh. Oh, good. Oh, <laughs> uh, you were off. You were off. I know you were. Okay, thank you. That is unanimous. Thank you, thank you everybody. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to staff reports and uh, community rec reopening plans. Shauna Jennings, manager of Rec and Community Service. Hi, Shauna. Hello, good evening. Can everybody good hear me? Evening. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Uh, so good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm here today to provide an update with regards to the recreation reopening plans. Um, as we know, March 17th uh, was a big change of things that were happening in the Uh-oh, we lost you. Shana? Hey, don't Shana, us, we can't. Don't leave us now. Uh-oh. World here. So recreation services, facilities, and... Hey, Shana. Can you hear me? Shana, if you could uh, try turning off your video or something. It broke up and we missed a whole chunk. Is that better? It seems to be. Maybe speak slower. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> you still with me here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, March 17th saw us shut down recreation services, uh, programs and a few facilities, definitely all the indoor facilities and most outdoor facilities. Um, as we know, kind of moving through this pandemic, uh, things have been changing quickly. Um, it's unfortunate for recreation and parks which are fundamental to the community's physical, mental, and social health, that those are things that we uh, needed to shut down um, in light of this global crisis at a time when access to recreation and parks is more important than ever. So we are um, definitely excited to kind of see BC moving through to phase two. Um, the past few months, recreation and youth services have remained engaged with the community um, through online programs and events. We have had some success with this and are able to provide some socialization for the community while everyone is remaining isolated. However, we are very eager to move forward and start to safely re-engage with the community. Uh, I've been working really closely with my colleagues across the province, so through the British Columbia Recreation and Parks Association, the Municipal Insurance Association of BC and Vancouver Coastal Health, 
Um, the VCRPA was tasked with creating a reopening plan for uh, guidelines for the recreation sector. And um, we, uh, all of the jurisdictions across the province have been working collaboratively to try and reopen um, in a bit of a collaborative way. Uh, it was in the sector that the closing of facilities there was a lot of uncertainty and chaos around that process. Um, so we're hoping to reopen more collaboratively than, uh, than the closure happened. Um, we're currently in phase two. I think everyone in your package should have the recreation reopening phase. And so the five, we're really focusing right now on five key program areas. And those are um, what the rec staff have been working on. Um, recently. So one is the outdoor adult fitness. So we will be looking to start some adult fitness outdoors. Uh, I'll just make a comment in general that all of these programs that we're going to um, be looking at now are socially distant, or sorry, physically distant. We have a lot of protocols in place. Um, I've been working closely with the Joint Health and Safety uh, Committee with BIM and also developing recreation specific protocols and program specific protocols. So that is all very um, detailed as we move forward. Um, adult fitness is having a bit of a, a pickup in terms of people coming out. We had our first class yesterday with five participants. So that's uh, that was a success. Um, summer day camps and summer play care are both the next uh, things that we're looking at. So the, uh, we have gone ahead and hired summer staff uh, to run the day camps and the play care. Before we did that, we did put a survey out to the community for both day camp and play care. And the, uh, it was a large number of respondents, I think over 50, close to 60 respondents. Um, with over half of those people saying yes, that they would be interested in putting their children in day camps. So part of the reason we did that um, that survey was that it is a lot of work to pull together the camps and hire staff and do all of those things. We wanted to make sure there was an appetite in the community for that and that people would feel comfortable bringing their kids to day camps, knowing that there are enhanced protocols. We have smaller groups. Um, so typically we would run about 14 or 15 kids to two leaders. We're going to keep that to nine kids and one youth volunteer. Uh, to two liters. So we are, um, we are decreasing our ratio there of kids to leaders to um, promote the social distancing and having smaller groups in the space. Um, both age groups, so six and seven year olds, as well as eight to 12 year olds were interested in day camps every day and also um, long, long days. So we did supply as in part of the survey half day options, but people wanted a longer day um, option for their kids. Similar results were for play care, which would be child minding for ages one to four. Uh, we have put some restrictions around that as well. Instead of having two sessions that we would normally have, we will only have one two hour session um, so that there isn't needing to be cleaning in between the two uh, sessions. Um, the other program we're looking at is youth. So we run a leaders in training program that's supported by the first credit union every year. And we will be looking to do that. So 12 to 15 year olds generally, and they um, do some training with our staff. One of those trainings will be on Zoom and one will be physically distanced. Um, uh, they will um, be uh, the day camp volunteers. So those leaders in training will have some volunteer opportunities and we'll we're going to just have one uh, per camp per week this year. Uh, I'm also working closely with the sports user groups. So they have, um, in particular, the soccer club. So Bowen Island FC has uh, approached me. They're eager to get their, um, their members back out on the field. So I'm working closely with them in regards to uh, their COVID safety plans. Um, they have gone through a rigorous um, guideline approval as well in the sports sector. So all of that uh, via sport has put out something that was approved at the provincial level. And now the provincial sport organizations are approving 
uh, have guidelines for the local sport organizations to follow. So um, we are making sure that all of those guidelines and procedures and protocols are in place uh, so that we can run safe programs and be able to rent uh, um, our facilities, in this case, the fields, to the user groups who are, who are um, eager to get back out there. Uh, looking more towards the financial piece, so Bowen Island Recreation did lose um, the spring season, unfortunately, in terms of programming. Um, but we are, uh, the, the loss there financially was approximately $35,000 uh, of what we would have normally brought in. So that's um, an unfortunate uh, circumstance for this um, pandemic for BIM. Um, as well as having all of that lost opportunity for the residents and the community to be able to come together to do activities. Uh, I have worked up um, numbers for staff um, for the day camps and play care and what that looks like financially. And assuming we can run at full capacity for camps, we are very close to breaking even on those. And that is always recreation's goal is to uh, operate on a cost recovery basis. Um, so we're pretty close there. They may, may, we may run camps at a bit of a deficit, but I would really encourage um, council to support the running of those camps in order to support the families um, on Bowen Island as everyone returns to work and the kids um, obviously get huge benefit from coming to camp and being with their friends and learning new skills. So those are, um, uh, we are very close, as I said, in terms of finances to run those programs successfully. Um, as I said, for public engagement and community strategy, communication strategy, we did um, go out to the community before we put programs in place. So we're um, confident that that people are looking for those opportunities. And I guess just in closing, I would just come back to that recommendation um, to resolve that council would support moving forward with recreation programming resuming at a reduced capacity in order to adhere to the public health orders work safety C requirements and that council approve the recreation restart plan as included in the report. And just to also say that everything in that plan um, is based on where we are today from the province um, and the public health orders and that we will amend or change all of those things as required um, if things change in the pandemic situation. And open to any questions. Oh, Gary, Gary, I can't hear you. Okay, there we go. Yeah, thank you, Shauna. Uh, that's a tremendous thing. And uh, so nice you're scrambling to get back uh, some funds for the summer session there. That's really great. Really appreciate that. And I have no issues with it whatsoever, as long as we're following work safe in the uh, provincial health guidelines, which I'm sure you are. So anybody else have any comments? Go back in here. Yeah, I had to. Okay, David, go. Hand up. Yeah, and Shauna, I really appreciated reading your report and uh, and listening to your presentation. Uh, it's so important that we we get people back into into the activities that we have, um, but we obviously have to do it in such a careful and safe way. And um, you know, we've been in a province that um, you know, if it were a country, we'd be one of the best in the world. Not quite as good as New Zealand or Taiwan, but pretty good. And uh, it's all because we've been careful, we followed science, science and that's, you know, that's moving right down into your work and really pleased to see that. And so I just have uh, congratulations on all the work and that we're going forward. I really, uh, really appreciate this and uh, I'm happy to support the resolution. Thank you, David. Sue Ellen? Yeah, thank you. I'm, um, uh, thank you for the report. It's good to see uh, recreation, which sometimes can seem airy fairy, but really it's an important health aspect of our community. And uh, being on a cost recovery basis, um, it doesn't really usually cost us very much money, except in, in a situation where you have to do a lot of cancellations. So I'm uh, I'm delighted to see the detail, and um, uh, because I think it's um, it's a very efficient program uh, as well as. Uh, so important for health. So I'm glad you're able to open and I'm in support of the motion. Thank you, Sue Ellen. Rob? 
Yeah, thanks, Shana, for the report. And uh, very similar to what's happening across the Lower Mainland. You know, I work for the Rec Commission in North Van, so we're pretty much doing the same thing. They actually <laughs> sucker me into teaching a 7 a.m. class tomorrow in the rain outside, which I'll probably <laughs> regret. <laughs> but uh, watch out, Shauna will ask you to teach some classes. That's right. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I think the community's ready. Um, uh, the, you know, the Daddy and Me program, they've been meeting at the dock already for two weeks by themselves. So it'd be nice to get the facilities as we obviously with the health guidelines uh, get to go ahead to move forward at a good pace because people are ready and I'm completely in support of running the day camps uh, during the summer I think you know without that it'd be a we'd have a lot of issues so good on you best of luck and I think it's going to be really popular in North Finn the numbers are all our classes are filled so right. you know I think we're you know there's the people are wanting to get back so yeah. good on you and I'll be supporting it thank you okay, Gary thanks, if there's nobody else do you want me to read the recommendation Yes, please. Do you want me to read the recommendation if there's nobody well, else? Well, it's uh, yeah, actually, okay. so uh, we're around if you want. Liam, Hang on. I think oh. I see our CAO. Okay, good. So I'll move it. Yeah. Oh, your CAO? Oh. Liam. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to add one comment that uh, came out of the RAC meeting last week, too, that uh, um, they're hoping to put out a, a sort of a joint communication uh, tomorrow. Um, it just was, came through very last minute. Just that all of the metro communities are working collaboratively, uh, basically trying to be have a coordinated uh, approach to reopening. And uh, you know, recreation is a key part of that. Libraries as well. And and so I did want to just uh, send some kudos out to the different uh, program areas, Shauna and and others, for collaborating with their counterparts. And so I think. Um, if this, if mayor and council do support this plan, that um, would wouldn't mind a blessing to uh, also support that joint uh, release that would go out tomorrow, just saying that we're all collaborating together. Okay, great. I'll move that, Gary. Okay, hope to do. Uh, have you got that in there somehow? Did you want that formally in there? Is that is that necessary Liam do you feel oh no I, I, I don't know that okay. it's necessary to formally put it in there but sorry didn't mean to add I just want to share the uh the, the other collaboration that's going on in the background okay fabulous all right then go ahead Rob yeah so I'll move that motion it's yeah. uh, do you want me to read it out hope or is it the, no yeah no we're good to it. go so I'll move it thank you I'll second it Okay. Uh, last question, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Aye. you. Yeah, all right. 7.2 development variance permit Thank applications. You. Hi, Shana. Thanks, Shauna. Thank you right. very much, Shauna. Uh, DVP 05 2020 816 Valhalla Place, Madrona Fine Homes. Emma. Emma nice. Chow. Thank you, Mayor um, and Council. I'm just going to pull up the presentation. Oops. Sorry, it's not showing up. There it is. Oh, it's coming. There it is. Okay, excellent. Um, so as mentioned, this is a development variance permit application for 816 Valhalla Place. Sorry, that's a typo. Um, okay. And this is coming to council for introduction. The subject property is located in the Queen Charlotte Heights neighborhood on the east side of the island as shown here. And um, just a bit of background. This is a fairly small lot. It slopes quite steeply down towards the east. And the existing house is located on the only flat spot on the lot, which is at the top of the slope on the west. The applicant would like to build an addition to the existing house, as shown here in red, to accommodate an additional bathroom. Um, he would like to maintain the existing house frontage uh, along Valhalla Place, and the existing house is currently encroaching into the front setback. Um, so 
in order to uh, maintain that frontage, the proposed siting for the addition will require a reduction of that front setback by more than half from 7.5 meters to three meters. So that is the requested variance, a front setback of three meters. And as you can see here to the south of the house, there is um, actually more buildable room that's outside of setbacks. But um, as you'll see later with some photographs, the terrain here is more steep than the north side and would provide a, a challenging building site. To the back of the house, um, the remainder of the lot, uh, it's, it's much more steep and not feasible for building. So okay. this, oh, sorry, did someone? No. Yes. Okay, um, this is a elevation from the, for the east side of the house. So this is the frontage along Valhalla Place and um, shown shaded in red is the proposed addition to the house. It is one story and you can see here relative to the existing house, it's uh, fairly small. This is a photograph of the frontage uh, taken on a site visit and again shaded in red is the proposed site for the addition. This is the elevation from the north side of the house. And again, the photograph of the north side of the house, this is roughly what it would look like. The second photograph is of the south side of the house, which I mentioned before, is quite a bit steeper in terrain. These photos were taken behind the house, so sloping down towards the east, as mentioned before, and as you can see, the drop off is, is quite um, severe. So given the site constraints um, and, oh, actually I didn't mention this, but one of the other reasons for this variance is the internal layout of the existing house. To um, optimize that layout for a bathroom, the north side was uh, the most conducive. So um, with those reasons, and also having received strata approval for the proposal, Staff is recommending that council go ahead with public notice for this application, DVP 05 2020. And that's it. All right, thanks, Emma. Questions? No questions? I have one. Fantastic. Oh, Sue Ellen. Uh, yeah, my question <laughs> is just, um, uh, I, you know, I, I kind of, think that everybody should follow the same rules and things like that. I recognize their site uh, constraints, um, uh, but I also think that setbacks from roads are important uh, to maintain neighborhood character and to keep the original intent of the layout of the neighborhoods. And um, so I'm, uh, and I also think Bowen needs smaller houses as well as bigger houses. and. Is there anything else you can tell us about the house? Um, is it all one level? I couldn't tell from the photo. Uh, no, it's a two-story house. The addition, the proposed addition is one story. Right, okay. It just seems like it's, um, all right. I'm not sure if I'm in favor of uh, giving development variance permits all the time. I think that they um, general, gradually over time, they erode the, uh, um the public space and the uh and the feeling of like white space in a neighborhood and uh and i think um um you know i don't i just don't i don't see the need i don't see the uh um uh, i don't think i'm going to be voting in favor of this thank you i might we'll see okay anybody else You want so somebody you, to read the, the variance notice? Sure. I can find in here. The council, um, but notice will be, the notice will be given that council will be considering the issuance of the DVP 05 2020 for the variance of front setback for 816 Valhalla Place, legally described as Strata Lot 20, Group 1, District Lot 2619, LMS 2199, PID 023-264-896, at the July 13, 2020 meeting of council. The council authorized staff to give notice for the consideration of issuance of DVP 05-2020 in accordance with Section 499 of the Local Government Act 
to all properties within 100 meters of the legal boundary of 816 Bell Hall Place, legally described as Strata Lot 20, Group 1, District Lot 2619, LMS 2199, da-da-da-da. Um, so I make that motion. Thank you, Allison. I'll second that. And uh, any further discussion? I think uh, I just want to make it clear that they're already uh, over that front setback. So all we're doing is making it legally non-conforming, I guess. And then there's a small addition on the side. I certainly don't have a problem with it, obviously. Um, us, any further sorry, discussion? Sorry, Mayor, um, uh, are they, I didn't hear the planner say that they were over the existing setback already. Is that? I don't know. Um, maybe Emma? you can yes, clarify. They are. They are, they are. Look at the plan in front of you. Sorry, I didn't catch what you said, David. Yes, it's, the map. it's clearly they're already, and you did say it, Emma, they're already, the, the bathroom is at the same frontage as the rest of the house. Um, so it's not like, yeah, it's just in, just in the line with the front of the house, the existing front of the house, which is three meters back of the road. Understood, Sue Ellen? So the, those dotted lines, yeah, I think I got it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any further is discussion? Correct? Is that correct, Emma? Yes, the existing house is currently sited within the front setback. Thank so you. The proposed addition is just continuing that front, um, the same frontage line of the existing house. So it's asking for the same um, encroachment into the front setback. Thank you. That that helps. Thanks for the clarification. Can I just uh, ask a follow up question? Um, yes. When was the strata originally uh, built? Do you know when the house was originally built? Is that in the file somewhere? Um, yeah, I, we should have documentation, but I don't have that off the top of my head. I, I guess my question is, I know when we did the land use bylaw in 2002, we changed some of the setbacks. And from what they had been when um, things that were built prior to 19, uh, in, prior to 2002. So, uh, they may have been caught with something right like that. Yeah, uh, whatever. Um, is that it, Allison? Yeah. Okay. I'll ask a question all in favor. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Me. Okay. So on fast, opposed. Thank you. Anybody and else? And Rob. They're Rob, are you them. opposed? Rob? You're muted. Do you... Rob, can you confirm? I voted, I, I voted four. Okay, four, okay. So one four. in opposition, Sue. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna move on to, uh, where are we here? No, we're not there. Um, okay, benefits uh, of inclusion in the Islands Trust, a follow up to the March 4th, 2020 meeting, Russ Hudson Diller and the CAO Islands Trust. Um, who's handling that? I can speak to that if you'd like. Um, either you or Michael, one of the two. I don't know why it's there, Hope. I, I, have, to, I have to be honest with you. I'm, I, I, I'm actually not sure we've received it. I, I guess we, this is the official confirmation we've received it, I, I have to presume. Yeah, it was it was emailed to mayor and council. It was addressed to Councillor Kale. Okay. Um, so the recommendation is just to receive it for information. Okay. Then I would happily propose that council receive for information the briefing prepared for, by the Islands Trust Chief Administrative Officer dated May the 19th, 2020. I'll second that. Any okay. further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So the post-COVID homelessness, Mayor Rob Vagramov, the city of Port Moody. Uh, this is fairly self-explanatory. It came to the mayor and he's looking for people to join in on his. Uh, so the second part of the where is, is probably what the resolution, the resolution is at the top, the second part of it is what he's, his statement. Does anybody have an issue with that? I do. Oh, you do? Yep. Okay. Why? Um, if, I, if I can speak to it, it my, uh, 
Um, I mean, it's all it seems very worthwhile. My only question is uh, is about the very last point um, okay. in it, which says that council supports a return to the large scale supportive housing arrangements for those afflicted by mental illness, such as a revived facility at Riverview. Yeah. And so this is speaking to institutions for the mentally uh, ill and um, and I don't have enough information to support that. That's not my uh, um, area of expertise, but I, I also, uh, uh, I've read, among my things I've read that says that institutions are not always the best idea for um, those afflicted with mental illness. So the best thing for communities. And um, I think we've got other crises like climate change and biodiversity maybe that I could speak to, but this particular one, uh, part of that, I have a problem with uh, supporting. I'm not All sure right. what other members think. All right. Anybody else? Any other comments? It's either that or, you know, the problem was that once they closed down the institutions, they all ended up on in uh, the east side of Vancouver on the streets. So that's if that's your option, I guess. Uh, it might be preferable. It might not be preferable. I, I can't say I'm not a, you know, certainly not qualified in that area. But uh, what they're saying basically is let's put some money into the homeless, which we don't do. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, I've got a comment on this, uh, Gary. David, go ahead. Sure. Uh, this came up, um, Mayor Vagamov. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, he discussed this at a COVID task force meeting. And um, and so the, you know, the, obviously some of the big cities have some real problems with homelessness, as Gary was saying. Um, and um, there's a general understanding and a general discussion by the mayors that the issue is, is um, obviously the issue is money, but the issue is also mental illness. And that, that needs to be treated by, by the province. The province and the feds perhaps, but really the province, they're responsible for health. The province has to step up, step up because the municipalities don't have the resources to deal with these issues. And, and so that's really the essence of what he was talking about. And now I, I, I agree with the last line. It says, uh, I'll just flip my here to um, a large scale supportive housing. But large scale just means, it doesn't mean it needs to be one giant institution that, um, you know, it's a story of, you know, how things used to be done. Uh, but it, it needs to be large scale because there's a lot of people. Uh, but whether it's a giant facility, um, you know, I mean, who knows? I'm not the expert in that at all. But, but I certainly no. support the essence of what Mayor Vagramov and other mayors, this got unanimous support at, uh, at the um, uh, COVID task force meeting from all the other mayors. Can't go too far wrong. It's not that, um, it's not, it's pretty general in its terms. It's saying, let's go back where we're starting over again. Let's, uh, let's look after our homeless populations and, our, and people with um, the mental disabilities. Uh, any other comments on this? Maureen has got her hand up. Sorry. Uh, Maureen, go ahead. Yeah, um, I agree with Sue Ellen. Um, I'm quite uncomfortable with that, uh, the, the last part of the, of the recommendation. I'm also curious if this was presented uh, at the uh, COVID uh, task force, which is um, part of uh, the Metro Vancouver um, deliberations. Why is something like this not coming from Metro Vancouver rather than from um, uh, Mayor Bagrabov? David? I can't, speak to that. I can't speak to that. It, it did come the, um, I think I reported on it last time from the COVID it did, yes. uh, that it, it was letter to the province and we could go find that letter. Um, why this came from Mayor Vagramov, I, I can't answer. Don't know. It's something he's done separately, I presume. He's looking for support from the mayors, obviously. And uh, maybe because you represent me there, I wasn't there to get that message. I don't know. Um, okay, well, the recommendation is that council support the mayor signing a letter on behalf of council addressed to the Prime Minister Trudeau and, and Premier Horgan regarding post-COVID homelessness. Homeless 
effectiveness as included in the June 8, 2020 regular council agenda. There's a whole bunch of whereas is there and it says, therefore it be a resolve that council considers a return to the normal state of homelessness in our region, province and nation after the COVID emergency fundamental, is after the COVID emergency fundamentally, oh God, unacceptable. They're two separate motions. Yeah. So if you want to deal with the first one. Okay, so on the first one, um, any further discussion on that? Did I see Alice in your hands up? Well, it's referring to a letter, but I don't think I have a letter. It says the letter addressed to Prime Minister Trudeau is included in the agenda. It's not in the bottom? It's, um, it starts on page three of the attachment, Councillor Moore. Yeah. I don't have, okay, I'm looking at my hard copy of the agenda and I didn't see it. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so that's basically just a heads up there. What, um, uh, any other conversation on this? Okay. Uh, the first part, I'll ask the question all in favor. Aye. It hasn't been moved and seconded, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. So I'll move that first part. No, Do I have I'll a second? I'll second it. Thanks, David. Okay, I'll now I'll ask a question all in favor. Aye. Okay, how are we doing there, Hope? Uh, everyone except for Councillor Fast. All and, right. Hang on. And, Did Ma vote for? and Maureen? Yeah. Oh, sorry, didn't see you. Okay. Everyone uh, except Councillor Fast and Maureen. Okay, in opposition. Yeah. All right. And uh, for the second part of it, which, so be it resolved, the council considers a return to the normal state of homelessness in, in our region, province and nation after the COVID emergency fundamental, fundamentally unaccept, oh, I see, okay, fundamentally unacceptable. And the council called the government of Canada, the government of BC and the Metro Vancouver Regional District to use the post-COVID recovery as an opportunity to upgrade our society by eliminating homelessness. And the council supports a return to large-scale supportive housing arrangements for those afflicted by mental illness, such as the revived facility at Riverview. Okay, I'll move that. Do I have a second? Sue Allen, are you second here or talking? I, I was gonna ask if it was possible to leave off the very last piece so that I could vote in favor of this because I think it's a really good initiative. And if we just leave off that little bit at the end, it well, starts that council supports a return to large scale supportive housing arrangements for those afflicted by mental illness. No, no, I understand, I understand what it says, but it is part of the resolution. I can't, I also it's, think a, it's, it's either that or it isn't. I also Maureen. think it's important to um, Mayor Bagrabop that it be there because Riverview is in his area. Oh, of course, yeah. How actually affects the emphasis that he's trying to give here. Okay. Allison, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I, I think we've done this in the backwards order. I think we should have passed the resolution first and then passed the resolution to support you signing the letter. Yeah, um, true. Yeah. Um, yeah Mayor um, Stewart from uh, Coquitlam always talks about this too. So, um, yeah. Uh, it's certainly a, a key issue that I think they would like, like to, you know, see to be activated. And I don't, you know, I'm recalling my uncle, he used to, who is now deceased, but he was a doctor and he was very upset when they closed Riverview. So I'm yeah. afraid. Any other comments before um, I call for the vote? Need a second or also. I'll second Sorry? it. I thought David second. Seconded I, the previous. Oh, did, okay. I thought he did. Too. Can, can, can somebody, I think can somebody, Alex seconded the second one. Okay. Can somebody okay. confirm for me where does it end? That's it. So no, it all, the, all three, all the three paragraphs. Part, you have to flip your page. Yeah, all three. So paragraphs. it ends at the word Riverview? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So I'll ask the question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Okay. And opposed? Opposed. Opposed. Okay. Who have we got in opposition? I hope I can't see them all. Maureen and Sue Ellen. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll move on to the reports of committees, cow and commissions. Uh, Councillor Nicholson, a recommendation from the Heritage Commission meeting. Yeah, um, this is a request to follow up with Metro uh, Parks regarding the uh, Davies Orchard revitalization project. Um, when uh, Dennis was here, uh, he and I, Jeff Patrick from Metro uh, Vancouver uh, uh, Regional Parks, and also um, Mike Rep have had a, a conversation from, from parks. We had a conversation about um, a bundle of the of, uh, Metro issues and, and this was one of them. One of the things that was emphasized was that it would be helpful if there were a resolution on the books um, stating that council would like some clarification um, on what's going on. Um, in the in the orchard, and uh, you know, whether they're going to be taking any steps to winterize the remaining cottages uh, before they fall down, uh, the Heritage Commission um, felt very strongly that this should be put to council, so that council could decide whether it wished to make this request as a council, as opposed to um, what we've done recently, which was a conversation among park staff and myself and the acting CEO. Uh, yeah, that's, um, it's a good point, Maureen. I agree with you because that seems to be the only way we're gonna find out what is going on there. I don't know if winterizing the, protecting the cottages because I think they're all coming down anyway. So, um, but I don't have a problem with it and uh, I would certainly uh, recommend moving that. Anybody else on a second there? I'll second. second that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll take Rob. I think he was in there first. Yeah. Uh, any further discussion on this? Could I could I make a, a, a suggest an amendment? The council sure. directs staff to follow up with Metro Parks. Good idea. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Allison, I still see your hand up there. Are you in or out? Oh, um, I just had a quick follow-up question. Maureen, the cottages that are still standing are the ones that were in their plan to stay? Yes. Uh, that is my understanding. So there are six in the okay. orchard. Two of them are in use by um, Bowen Heritage. Bowen Heritage just um, recently uh, signed a five-year um, agreement with uh, Metro Parks for the use of the uh, uh, the museum cottage and the um, uh, the orchard cottage, which is used as an office. The other two are um, leased to Rondi Dyke, and then there are two that are on the last legs. But the last version of the um, uh, concept uh, that they had come up with still showed the six cottages um, continuing on. Okay. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, Allison, you've still got your hand up, or are you? No, oh, I keep forgetting to lower it. Okay, Sue Ellen, please. Uh, thank you. I'm just going to speak in favor of this motion as amended, um, because uh, I don't want more delay. And um, if those two remaining cottages uh, that are uh, falling in dis disrepair are allowed to further decline, uh, then we could be back to the concept drawing board again. And I, I just don't want to waste the planning time and the public participation and the pain and the uh, uh, passion that's already gone into the pro process this far. Uh, and I also want to signal um, to Metro Vancouver that we care about this and we want uh, that project to go ahead uh, and um, as envisioned and uh, the, with the, what we've heard so far. So. I want to support the process and by supporting this motion I feel I'm supporting the process and the concept of uh, the cottages in Davies Orchard being a feature that visitors want to come to see. It's related to the um, branding and to the um, holiday aisle 
feeling and to the uh, heritage, the meaning of Bowen Island. So I'm in speaking in support. Okay, you're gonna second it then? I'll second it. Oh, thank you. I think yeah, somebody already did, but. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Um, I'll ask a question all in favor, aye. 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 Okay, how do we do, Hope, good? Unanimous. Oh, fantastic, okay. So 9.2 Councillor Hawking re-recommendation for the Advisory Planning Commission. So I'll just hop in there and just say I, I sort of jumped the gun on that and Daniel will be reporting back at the next council meeting um, with regards to this referral to council. So nothing needed from council at this time. Okay, thank you, Hope. We'll so go we to 9.3. Councillor Kale Morris and Nicholson re-recommendation from the Community Economic Development Committee meeting of May 25th. Who would like to talk to, to that? I could start. Um, okay, thanks, Marie. So you have two recommendations uh, before you from our last committee meeting. Uh, the first recommendation came up in the context of um, uh, the discussion of uh, short-term uh, rentals. It's not actually entirely clear that that would be where- Thank you. From. Um, that uh, resolution passed with um, one in opposition. I was in opposition primarily because there's a statement in here, uh, the second clause, that the bylaw adoption process be slowed down. And I was opposed to that. Councillors Morrison and Kim supported the, um, that recommendation. The, the second one um, comes out of the work that uh, the Community Economic Development Committee has been doing. I'll talk about that later in the agenda, but it comes out of the work that we've been doing with local businesses during COVID-19. And uh, the staff had indicated to me that it would be helpful to have on record um, a direction from council uh, to staff uh, to um, uh, have in the books that they should be responding uh, quickly um, and appropriately to COVID-19 related requests from the business community. So an example of that was the request that we received from the um, distillery and recently um, from uh, the pub uh, regarding the um, uh, expansion of uh, uh, the service area. So that, that's the context that this is coming from. I'll let Councillor Kale and Councillor Morse say some more. Thank you. Uh, Michael or Allison? I think you've covered it, Maureen. I'm, I'm just not sure process-wise at this point because we dealt with and gave second reading and I thought we brought the gist of resolution one forward at the last council meeting when we were dealing with the short-term yeah. rentals. I, th no. I, I think the process, the, the first recommendation is in fact the comments that were being provided yeah. to and that. Uh, Emma's not here at the moment, but they were comments to be provided to Emma as part of part of the process. So yeah. um, I think that the committee just felt that they wanted to firm up their feedback and give them a bit of room and get them to council in this form. But they are essentially comments uh, in an ongoing uh, bylaw development process. So yeah. I'm not certain what to do with the first one either. I think uh, maybe we just move that um, There's, also receive the comments from the Economic Development Committee with respect to the short-term rentals. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. I second that. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, what did we end up with there? Did you change the whole thing or what? No, I'm just leaving number one as treating them as comments. So okay. with respect to point one, the motion would be that council receive the comments from the Economic Community Economic Development Committee uh, related to short-term rentals as set out in point one of the of 9.3 of the agenda. Okay, I, that's a good call there. I like that. And, uh, that's okay, uh, any further discussion on that part? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Thank And then you. with the second one, I, I would like to move it as, yeah. a, as a recommendation so that we have that on, on so yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll just read it. Don't have the a problem on that. Development committee 
recommend that Council recognize the impacts that COVID-19 has had on Bowen Island businesses and that Council direct staff to respond quickly and appropriately to COVID-19 related requests from the business community in recognition of the need for innovation and flexibility in uncertain times. I would definitely second that. Any further discussion on that one? I'll ask a question. Okay, sorry, Allison. Hope, does that make sense in the point of a council resolution or should it say that um, council uh, recognize, just start with council recognize the impacts? Yeah. Yeah. So we remove the community economic development committee recommend. Oh, yeah, that, would, that should not have been included. So yeah, yeah. just that council, thank you. Okay, just start okay, with a little word, council. Little word smithing there. Yeah. Okay, so uh, do you wanna read what you've got there then, Hope? Uh, just it, as they said it, just without that part, so that council recognized the impacts of COVID-19 has had on the Bowen Island businesses, and that council direct staff to respond quickly and appropriately yeah. to COVID-19 related okay. requests. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's good. Uh, so with that amendment, I'll ask the question all in favor. Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Yes. Very good. Okay, new business, Metro Vancouver Director David Hawking, update. Okay, thank you, Gary. I've got, uh, I guess, three things I could talk about. Uh, one is a, ho a housing committee. You remember I talked, uh, well, I talked in close about the results of that expression of interest. Yeah. And, and so it came that that's, I've now um, have, have contacted the, uh, um, the Birch folks, so everybody knows about this. But I also spoke to the, um, the head of Metro Vancouver Planning and Housing about asking, okay, well, tell me about our, our, our proposal. Was it good? Was it bad? What was the weakness? And she said it was a very good proposal, but it's interesting that it's for 22 to 27 sites uh, or, or, or units rather, but the other ones, the ones that were selected were somewhere between 80 and 177 units. In other wow. words, they were much bigger. And so yeah. the small size was a problem, but also the cost of construction on Bowen was seen Hi. as a problem. But the, the project was seen very positively because it is so close to all the amenities, walkable to transit and ferries and so on. Um, but also the role of work was seen very positively. So they were encouraging, encouraged me to apply again in another year, which could be appropriate Good. to pass that on to Birch. Um, the second was in the COVID, um, the COVID uh, meeting, I, I guess just last week. Yeah, um, one of the interesting things, well, the, the essence of it was a presentation by um, the former Vancouver planner, um, Larry Beasley, and the Toronto planner, uh, former Toronto planner, Jennifer Kiesmatt, who was um, sort of a rock star in the planning world, um, on something called the Declaration for Resilience in Canadian Cities. And it's um, a pretty, it's an extremely, it's sort of in line with what a lot of the discussion has been around at Metro Vancouver, but also in the media generally, is that we need to learn from this and make sure that when we you know, go back to normal, that some of the problems that we've been wrestling with are being addressed in, in the way that we respond. And so in this declaration, there's a section on responsible use of the land for municipalities. There's a section on accelerating decarbonization of transportation and another one embracing sustainability in our built and in our natural environment. So this was presented and it was taken by the board. Uh, there was by the, sorry, the COVID committee of the board. So it's basically all the mayors. Um, to direction to staff to have a look at it and make recommendations. But several of the mayors were pointing out that in the end, it, the land use issues, many of the things are, are, could be implemented by local governments. Um, and so it's going to probably go through Metro Vancouver, have some changes suggested to it, and then go to local governments. Um, I made the comment that it's called a declaration for Canadian cities. Uh, but really, it's because those planners come from big cities, uh, but I pointed out that Metro Vancouver actually has villages and a First Nation and all kinds of, you know, uh, sizes of places. Uh, but this was just as applicable to smaller uh, municipalities as well. And if the, the words were changed to local governments, uh, then it would be more appropriate. So we'll see what comes uh, to us, but I'm going to, I didn't circulate it ahead of time because I didn't want to have a long conversation about it, but I'm going to now forward it to everybody so that you've got a chance okay. to see it. 
And, um, and then presumably it will, will come to us perhaps in a month or something like that um, after some changes by Metro Vancouver. Okay. And Super. To, to the website so you can have a look at it. Okay. Uh, the final thing was a board budget workshop a couple of days ago. And it was an interesting process. What the board was concerned uh, last year because of the tax increases and yeah. some of the massive investment Project. So the tax increases are really for everybody else except us, um, or a, a few folks like us who don't have, it's water and sewer that really uh, big, expensive, massive water projects, massive sewer projects. Um, and um, so what, what the board did was send it back to staff from the five-year plan, five-year financial plan, um, it would be about a six or 7% tax increase each year. And they said that's unacceptable, particularly in the situation we're in now. And they ask staff to go back and find a way to bring it down to somewhere maybe near half that. Um, and so that's what staff is going to do. So sort of an interesting process is that the, the, the directors would say they don't have the expertise to say, you know, this kind of project is appropriate and this one isn't because these are detailed big engineering projects, but rather to have staff as the experts figure it out and find a way to make this thing at three or 4% rather than six or 7%. The one thing that I spoke about was that the, the people said, oh, we should get back to the basics, that, that mon new money that was put in for housing, the new money that was put in for parks acquisition, we shouldn't be doing those things. Um, I disagreed. Um, when I look at our tax bill, I see that what we get from Metro Vancouver, I think, is excellent value. And the money yeah. that we're putting into housing, the money <laughs> acquisition is, is really important. And they're, they're, you know, pocket change compared to the big investments in those other things. And so any, everybody seemed to agree with me on that. So okay. interesting that those two things probably won't get cut, but there will be some changes in some of the bigger projects. And we'll have to see what staff comes up with. So it was an interesting, interesting process. So awesome. thank you. That's my thank request. you, David. Okay, 10.2, we'll move on to the Islands Trust Municipal Trustees Fast and Kill update. Okay. So Ellen? I'll, uh, I'll start. Um, I just wanted to let you know, we've got three things on the agenda, so I'm going to be really brief. 4.1a was my response uh, to Kevin Bernard when he um, emailed me. Um, asking if the Islands Trust would work with his coalition. So that's just in there for uh, transparency and to uh, let you know what I said to him. Um, I uh, 8.1, we've looked at, that's the CAO from the Islands Trust responding to um, Michael Kale. And um, 5.2, I don't know. Anyway, there's a bunch of them there. 5.2 is the one that we brought forward. And I just yeah. want to let people know, Trust Council will be happening next week, Tuesday and Wednesday on Zoom. So um, it's easier than ever to get to a Trust Council meeting. And there's going to be some uh, interesting presentations and um, delegations that people might be interested in. So uh, tune in, anybody who'd like to. Great. Thank you, Sue Ellen. Uh, I can only add that if you're not already Zoomed out, uh, Sue Ellen so well said, uh, please tune in. I don't think I can add anything to what she's said already. So thank you, Sue Ellen. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. Councillor Nicholson, Re Community Economic Development Committee. So this is jumping back to the recommendation that uh, just supported. This is a, a brief summary of some of the work that's been done over the last three months by the Community Economic Development Committee. And I won't spend a lot of time on it other than just highlighting um, top level uh, the, the, the various points. There have been weekly Zoom meetings for businesses and the attendance has been uh, anywhere from 20 to 80. Um, it's provided an opportunity for people to um, uh, learn about the supports that are available uh, to them. Uh, to have an opportunity to hear from other businesses uh, on the island, how they're managing things, and just simply to um, have a place to be, especially during the, the early uh, early months and in uh, March and, and middle of, of April. So our, our uh, yeah. 12th meeting is um, coming up on, uh, on this Wednesday, and 
as always, you're all invited to, to attend. Um, Chris Corrigan has been facilitating the meetings um, and he's been doing that as a community volunteer and uh, the, the chair of the committee has been um, uh, hosting the, um, the, the Zoom meetings. The second is the Business Navigators Program and that was funded um, in a pilot uh, project format by the um, Community Foundation through the Resiliency Fund. And that's been up and running. It's coming probably close to the end of its, um, of its first month. And there's a real focus on trying to figure out what kind of impact that has had, because that will help if we want to um, move beyond a, a pilot project. There was a community uh, town hall um, that was held on Saturday, and many of you uh, were there. So um, what we've sort of seen is we saw the initial Zoom meetings to get together the Business Navigators program, and that was intended to address <coughs> confidential matters that might not come up in the Zoom meeting. And then the community town hall was when the businesses started asking really serious questions about how's the community going to feel when we open? Um, how are they going to inter interpret that? So it was a very sort of organic process over, over that three-month period. We developed business signage for reopening and provided that um, to local businesses who were interested. There is an initiative called the Island Comeback that um, yeah. has uh, been developed by the Rural Islands Economic Partnership, which uh, Council has supported in, uh, in various forms over the last couple of years. And there are, there are 16 on the uh, website at, at the moment, there are about 25 who've signed up and you can donate or buy a gift certificate uh, for a local business. And there's more than a hundred um, from all the islands. And then finally, in this one, um, one of uh, my favorite outcomes from um, this last three months is Community Futures Sunshine Coast um, stepped up uh, in writing uh, to say that they would provide assistance to Bowen Island businesses. They had done so in the past on, a, on an informal basis, but it's now listed loud and clear on their, their website. And this is a, a nonprofit um, uh, organization that is funded by the federal government and technically Bowen is not eligible. So this is, we, we were successful, if you all recall, we were successful in getting rural uh, dividend funding, being deemed eligible for that. There were a parcel of federal programs that we are not eligible for, including community futures. So this is kind of a backdoor way of gaining um, access for our local businesses. Um, this was all done uh, mostly uh, done through uh, volunteer labor. There was a small um, stipend provided to the business navigators. The Island Comeback um, project is free for businesses to sign up. So I just wanted to have a record of, um, of what uh, our community members and our uh, municipal committee uh, members have done. And uh, I, I think it's really quite remarkable, yeah. And I'm, I'm very proud of them. And uh, I wanted to share that uh, with you because I imagine you feel much the same way. Thank you very much. And yes, we do. Uh, do you want to read that recommendation then, Maureen? Uh, yep, it's a simple one. Uh, yep. The council received for information the report titled Community Economic Development Committee Activity, March to June 2020, dated June 3rd, 2020. Okay. Thank you. Can I? David, a second. And all in favor. Wait, 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 uh, wait, wait. Oh, Sue Ellen. Could yeah. you put the words COVID-19 in there somewhere in, in the title? Just because five years from now, I'm not sure people would know what it was all about. Okay, so um, just amend. So the report now reads Community Economic Development Committee activities related to COVID-19. Oh, Thank perfect. You. Okay, back. friendly amendment. Second. Yeah. Okay. All in favor, one more time. Aye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Okay, back to you, uh, Councillor Nicholson. One more time, update to Council on Metro Vancouver Regional Parks Committee meeting. Uh, we have not met. We'll meet in another week in a bit, and then I may have something to say. 
All right, thank you. Councillor Allison Morris, update to Council on TransLink Mayor's Council meeting. Well, Councillor Morris here. Um, yeah. So I guess the last public meeting was basically all about uh, getting the bus service re going, money uh, issues, how budget's going to work, and there's a whole bunch of assumptions being made on, you know, will the ridership come back? Um, will people be reluctant, wanting to work cars? Um, so that's still very much a, you know, work in progress. And uh, you would have all seen the news articles in, I think, CBC and whatever the Prime Minister announced last week, or maybe it was, yeah, last week, that um, they're considering uh, transferring funds to the provinces for the municipalities to support their, their transportation systems. Um, but all the details have to be worked out. So no idea as to, you know, just how much or you yeah. know, how it might fall out. And you also would have seen all the information on the Surrey Langley Skytrain project because that made the news as well. And I think hope uh, attached to the last agenda the actual agenda package and the PowerPoint presentations that were made. But, um, so I don't know whether we should attach them to this agenda again now or not. I typically do that for all the regular updates for the Metro Vancouver. Yeah. But, yeah. So, um, yeah, well, the, if anybody wants to look at the presentations that were done, they were attached to the May 25th. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, Allison. And 10.6, we're going to move to a closed meeting. And the recommendation is that council move to a closed meeting immediately following the regular council meeting to discuss items pursuant to section 90-1 E, I, and K of the community charter. I'll move that. Second, please. I'll second, but Gary. You. I had one other thing I wanted to I made a ridiculous mistake at the beginning of the meeting. We had so much going on, but I wanted yeah. to say something about BC ferries. And um, I okay, I let's let's get this let's get this out of the way. So, all in favor of moving to the close? Aye. 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 Okay, that, how's that? Hope. Oh. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Um, Items removed from the consent agenda. We don't have anything there. We're just going to move right down here. Almost there, where it says, uh, Councillor Hawking. Do you want to just deal with that backup <laughs> in, in new business? Yeah. So, just okay. after the motion to move to a closed, we can. Yeah. Okay. We'll keep no them in there then. We need, you know, yeah, 10.7. Yeah. Go ahead, D David. Thanks. So, uh, I've been emailing folks with the uh, with the information from BC Ferries and also from the Ferry Advisory Committee. But so you're all aware, I think, that what happened is BC Ferries say they're going to reduce our, our service and they're going to, the plan was to cut the 7.30 Saturday and Sunday morning sailings. Now you all remember half a dozen or so years ago when BC Ferries cut sailings, uh, they cut a whole bunch of them. And then the transportation committee and municipality worked to get a couple of them back, and they did a survey with the with the, the, the residents and found that those 730 ferries were actually critical on Saturday, and and they proposed made a business case and so on. And BC Ferries brought them back in the spring of seven of uh, 2017. So what happened right now, strangely, when in 2019, when the new government reinstated all those, those ferry runs, they didn't reinstate those two because they'd already been reinstated in another way. And so they're not part, when, when, when the government reinstated things, they, they all became part of the service agreement. Those two runs aren't part of the service agreement. So when BC Ferries right now decided, well, we need to cut costs and fair enough, they do. Um, they just went and locked those off or said they were going to lock those off. So we had a meeting Sunday with the Ferry Advisory Committee and we wanted to do and um, resolved to do two things. One was to figure out which ferries would be the best ones to cut if we have to cut two. And so the decision was the 7 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. The 7 and 7.30 p.m. Um, on, on Sunday and the 7 and 7.30 on Tuesday. The reason for those is because to give 
basically the idea was um, the for our for our residents the more critical ferries are the ones in the morning where you're going to uh, an appointment a, a job or school or whatever it is and coming home it's not quite so critical um and the and so the 7.30 run is the same as the one on Saturday that we don't have. And so having it less complicated, so you don't have to remember, okay, different days, it's different ferries. It's that 7.30 coming home um, for three days a week that we won't have. Tuesday, because it's the least busy day of the week. Monday is a busy day, Friday is a busy day, Wednesday is a um, um, dangerous cargo, and Thursday is a new Friday. So that was that. The second thing that they want to do, and they're going to um, try to approach the minister, but asking council to approach the minister, is the trouble is if when it's fine right now to have reduced sailings because we have reduced volume and, and obviously we all need to work together on this. But when we get out of this situation, perhaps when we're in stage or phase four and everything is sort of back to normal, we'd be missing two runs. And so what we'd like, what the FAC is asking the municipality to do would be to write a letter to the minister to return all of 106 original sailings to our core service once we get back to normal. Let's say once we get back to stage four, something like that. So that's sort of what I'm putting to, or what the very advisory committee is putting to council. Do we want to go to the minister with a letter saying, we recognize this difficult situation now, but when we get back to say phase four, we'd like to get all of our 106 original sailing back into our core service contract. So, I think eventually when everything settles down, sure that would be that would be a nice option. But we've been very fortunate um, with cancellations. I mean, you look at the Horseshoe Bay and Nanaimo and that sort of thing that just got canceled outright. All through the all through the lower mainland, the cancellations were outrageous, and yeah. we came through that relatively unscathed. But I, I do uh, appreciate the fact that we we have to look at the desirable ones. Yeah, I don't. I certainly don't have a problem. I don't know how far it'll go, but it would sure be nice if we could get those back in there again. Yeah, and the point, Gary, is everybody recognizes. Yeah, we we got off really lightly in terms of cutbacks, yeah. and we we're not trying to push the issue now and say, hey, hey give us those ferries. What we're yeah. trying to say is, back when we get to phase four, back to regular times, we yeah. have 106 ferries. 106 daily runs is what we had, and we should go yeah. back, that, please. So, in other words, it's just putting that, getting that message out now, so that when we can refer to it again, you know whenever this is a year from now or who knows when this when this will be so do you want a resolution on that um can i just say something allison go ahead um a couple of questions um we got ourselves into a problem with resolutions on the fly with the okay. um trails i i have no problem with the concept but you don't talk about 106 runs it's round trips per day you've got to turn it into their vernacular and the province's vernacular and I have a question. They proposed to take out the weekend sailings. And the reason they did that is because the contract has 14 and a half round trips during the week. And, oh, it, oh, it doesn't say weekends, does it? It says two other days. Um, Allison, to, to get to your, where I think you're going is BC Ferries, the, the FAC went to BC Ferries and say, look, those two that you want to ditch are not good for us. Can we, can we do two different ones? Yeah instead and they said sure send okay, us so it, it's I'm, i don't have the contract i know the contract says 14 okay. and a half, 13 another day and 12 another day and it used to say weekends so if it doesn't say weekends then then we're we're okay they don't have to mucky with the province to amend the contract anyway is this uh, yeah. i don't see this as being time sensitive david no, for so, this so i'd like to you know, I think they need the the letter with the right terminology and everything that that fits contract terminology. So, so when it goes, there's no question. I, I'm quite happy to take some Bring time to and come back with a letter um, yeah. uh, that has all the details and so on. Sure, and I guess that would be awesome. Question Thank you. In, when you're talking about 106 daily runs. Sorry, Allison, I'll um, figure it out and I'll ask you the number. Yeah, let's not get into it right yeah, now. Okay. I was just thinking, was that was that going to get us the late night run back? Or just the 
we'll worry about that later, Allison. Okay. We'll worry about. All right. that. I, I wanted to put it on today, though, to make sure because this the change in 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 service is probably going to happen next week. That's why I wanted to make sure. Okay. Wherever. Thank you, David. Okay. Thank you very much. All done. All right. My pleasure. Uh, where are we here? We're right at the end of the road. Um, is uh, is Bronwyn here? Quite for question period. No. Okay. If not. This uh, Maureen, Maureen has her hand up. Oh, yeah. okay. Maureen, um, where are you? Go ahead. If we're looking at ferry um, mm. uh, changes uh, next week, we, we've had a number of things that have been sprung on us in, in the past while. It, it, could, could I ask that Hope speak with uh, Sophie and see what can get out to our public in in advance um, because I'm, I'm just concerned that we are ending a public council meeting with a lot of detail about changes coming to ferry runs that probably the majority of the public couldn't follow and I think that there needs to be some um, public facing communication on, on this because uh, having brought it up uh, we have not brought anything to the close. I agree, and I can do that, Maureen. I can work with Sophie and, and, um, and David. And, and I'll also uh, check with uh, the FAC with Melanie to yeah. see if she's received anything about the timing, but they said mid-month, which is kind of like a week from now or less. So. Yeah, yeah, we'll get right on that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, is everybody uh, happy with that? You okay with that, Maureen? Yeah. Okay, so this uh, general... This uh, regular council meeting is now adjourned and we're gonna to go to a close. Does anybody want five minutes? Yes. Okay. Yes, please. If five minutes, okay, we'll do about, uh, call, let's call it, well, let's just call it 925. If we're leaving okay, and signing back in? Yes. Uh, yes, we will have to, yes. 925. Okay. All right, thank you, everybody. All right, guys.